We can't hear you, Mayor. Holly, can you hear me? I can hear you, Augie. Now, Tom, you just need to unmute. You should be fine. Can you hear me? Now yeah. I can. Yeah, I'm going to go project your voice a little bit. <laughs> be louder, Tom. Yeah, very few times people told me that. Um, good evening and welcome to the September 27th Village of Mary Board of Trustees work session. I need a motion to open this meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, tonight, we're going to have uh, advice of council and uh, a quick, hopefully a quick, uh, executive session. Uh, I know Mr. Spolzino said he'd be here in a couple of minutes. Uh, so when he comes, we'll just let him in. Uh, okay, tonight, the advice of council the, uh, uh, about ZBA correspondence, the executive session, and I'll make the motion. Ethics board vacancy is anticipated that a motion will be offered to enter into executive session pursuant to 105.1F of the New York State Public Offices Law. And B, uh, General Foreman of DPW is anticipated that a motion will be offered to enter into executive session pursuant to 105.F of the New York State Public Offices Law. Uh, and I will make those motions. May I have a second, please? Second. Will we call the roll? Excuse me, Tom, there are four things? Or... I have three things. I, say again? I have three things. You, we have the general foreman. Got it. You have the um, general chairman. Uh, we don't have, um, we have the manager's uh, review. That's not on here. Uh, to amend it, to add it on there. What? I would like to amend the motion to add it to that. I thought that was going to be on there. I, as of Friday, that was supposed to be on there, but. Everybody's had the agenda. Well, I sent an email this morning, so. But as of Friday, it was going to be on there, and it didn't get on there. I think we have to clarify. I don't think it's a long conversation. I think we have to clarify something, to be fair. Okay, he made an amendment. So moved. I second it. We call. Trustee is young. Yes. Trustee Natchez. Yes. Trustee Lucas. Yes. Trustee Tafor. Yes. Mayor Murphy. No. Okay, uh, folks, if you could take a break, please. Smoke them if you got them. Not that group. <laughs> Be about 40 feet away from the building or this one. Uh for a minute, Jimmy, he's gonna close on his way out. Executive session. I log into executive session. Who's logging? I can't have a. Do you want to just not no, do no, it? Log in. Just like the, the question too. Brittany has to come in. There's still audio, guys. Just one of the chairs to come in. So I, they're waiting in the, the executive session. Okay. You made it. You look relaxed. Lawyers are stuck. 
much for your Ogie, there's still audio coming through. Um,
Hey, good evening. Hi, Andrew, this is Sally. Hey, Sally, how are you? I'm um, great, thank you. There's still an executive session, so if you just wanna hang out. We... Sure. Okay, thanks. Absolutely, no problem. Sally, what hour that executive session? Okay. I think that's a big screw up. <laughs> yeah, I think he was talking to his lawyer. Yeah. Tom, is your speaker? No, my speaker's not on. My mic is not on. I don't know, is it? I don't know. Is he getting, getting feedback? Somebody's mic is on. Sugar. Not mine. Oh. Maybe yours. I don't have no on Zoom. Maybe from this? No, no, no that's no. the main. It's coming from over there. Victor's your speaker? No. Nope. Not, 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 not your mute button, but where you hear from. Um, you're muted. Um, you're, um, you're yeah. But it's. Hold on. Is it stopped? Nora, talk. Hi. Yep. I think it's stopped. I think it's stopped. Yep. Okay. It's different, though. It's the output from the computer. Yeah. It's not the Zoom mute. It's, it's not. Yeah. It's not the Zoom. Andy, wait. <laughs> Hello, sir. All right. Good evening. Uh, we have Andrew Waite. He is from the uh, U.S. Uh, Geological Service. Uh, Jerry, is Andrew going to present to us? Yeah, he's going to tell us about the USGS river gauges, spelled incorrectly by him, correctly by me, <laughs> and um, the benefit of them and how they work so that the Board of Trustees knows exactly what we're getting um, for, um, uh, from, from the USGS uh, program. Take it away, sir. Okay, well, appreciate, uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to jump on the call here. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but, but glad to uh, connect via Zoom here and, and uh, present a few slides on the USGS gauging network. Let me see, typically we use Teams here at work, so we don't use Zoom all that much. Let me see if I can navigate this all right and get this uh, slideshow uh, up on the screen. Okay, tell me if you can see that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Super. Excellent. Got it to work. <laughs> so, uh, pre like I said, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present some slides here and some information on the USGS gauge network uh, and, and how our gauges work. Uh, some of the things that uh, I spoke with Jerry about and, and seem to be of interest are the types of gauges that the USGS operates, maybe some example photos of what they look like. Uh, the components of a stream gauge and what goes into making them work, uh, what's included in the operation and maintenance. We can look at some real-time data uh, on the web to see what some real-time data looks like if you're not familiar with that. We can talk about the water alert program, uh, which is a pretty slick program that a lot of folks uh, take advantage of. And then we can look at the proposed gauge locations um, and where we stand as far as uh, some of those sites. And then we can look at um, sort of the depth and breadth of the network as it exists in New York. I know there are some questions about gauges that may be in um, areas close by and uh, the expanse of the network throughout New York. So we can certainly talk about that too. So those are the things I, I plan to talk about. I have about 15 or 16 slides. Uh, and if you wanna stop me in between, please feel free to do so. And uh, I can answer any questions now or at the end. So these are a couple of um, 
caricatures of what our typical gauges look like, just to give you a little bit of background. The left on the left, we have what we call a stilling well, uh, and this has been sort of the gold standard in gauges for many years. Uh, although we typically don't install these anymore, they are fairly big, uh, and I have some pictures and examples of that. But basically, a stilling well is a shelter that you can walk physically walk into. And you'd be standing on a floor uh, right about here. Can you see my cursor as I have it on the screen yeah, there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so you would be standing on a floor right here above a well. And the water in the well is connected to the water in the river by way of these intake pipes. So when the water in the river rises, the water would be forced through the intake pipes. The water in the well would rise. And then we have a float on the surface of the water in the well that would rise with the water. And it would it would rotate what we call a shaft encoder. It would turn that rotation into a water level change. And we have instruments in here that would record the water level. And then we would transmit it via satellite, via GO satellite. So this is this is what a, a, a typical gauge looked like over the years. Uh, these have been in place for 40, 50, 60 plus years. Uh, anymore, what we do is we put in these pressure systems. And these are much more compact, they're smaller, and this is what would be installed if, if we proceed with the Mamaronek uh, sites. This is uh, a, basically a steel or aluminum box, it's about two, three, two feet by three feet, give or take. And in the water, instead of having a stilling well and intake pipes, we have a low pressure airline. And this low pressure airline is supplied compressed air by a mini compressor, it's a gas purge system, but a mini compressor inside the shelter. Uh, and what this does is it, it pushes air out into the stream and it measures the pressure of the water over the end of the cap here. Uh, and then that pressure is sensed by a pressure sensor, this thing here called a non-submersible pressure transducer. And it measures, or it, it measures that water pressure and then it converts it to a water level. And then the water level is read by our data logger which records the data and then transmits the data via GO satellite. And each of these gauges are powered by a 12 volt battery system. This does not require AC power, so they're standalone. Some of our gauges do have AC power for various reasons, but, but most of our gauges do not. These are just operated by battery and we have power supplemented by a solar panel. So our normal uh, data measuring and transmitting um, schedule is we measure, we record data every 15 minutes and we transmit data every hour. So every time we transmit data once an hour, four values come through over the, over the previous hour. For sites that are small drainage area sites like these here in, in the Maranek uh, that are being considered for uh, flood monitoring, we could, we have the ability to transmit every 15 minutes instead of every 60 minutes. And we could record data at a, 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 a more rapid interval, five minutes instead of 15. So every time we transmit on the 15 minute, on the 15 minute value, we'd get three, uh, three values that come through. So it's, it's a bit better on small drainage area sites and sites that tend to be flashy and, and sites that may be used for flood monitoring like these here. And a couple of quick pictures. This is what some of our gauges look like. These are, our, this is a stilling well right here in the middle. And this is a, basically a big old walk-in gauge. You'd be standing on top of a floor that's over a well. The well is connected to the river by intakes and, and it has that shaft encoder on the shelf. Uh, and again, this is our, our GOES transmitting antenna. This site happens to have AC power, but most of them do not. Uh, these are the pressure systems, and these are what we would install at the Mamaronet should this be approved. Uh, these are, again, like little two-by-three shelters. This one's on a pedestal, of course. And we have a pressure line that runs from here down the wing wall uh, of, this, of this particular bridge location. And supplemented, the power is supplemented by solar panel. We have GOES antennas here, and we have the same setup over here on the right. This one's just not on a pedestal. It's on the side of a, a bridge wing wall. Same type of setup, and I'll show you a quick image of what the equipment inside looks like. This is uh, this is a pressure site. This right here is the two. This is just a protective casing, but the the pressure line is inside here. This goes down into the river. It's supplied pressure by a mini compressor 
inside here. I don't have a picture of the compressor itself, but this is, this is the box that the compressor is in. Uh, the pressure is measured by this stage sensor, which converts the pressure to water level. Then the water level is sent over to our data logger. The data logger records it and transmits it via GOES and this antenna, you can't see it, but up on top of this antenna, we have a solar panel and a GOES transmitting antenna. And the entire system is powered by a 12 volt battery that's charged via, via solar panel. And another, another example of that real quick is the same thing. This is a little more compact because our, our compressor and our water level sensor are contained in the same box, but nonetheless, it, it operates the same way. Compressor, water level sensor. This is our recorder and transmitter that transmits via GO satellite, all powered by a 12 volt battery. Can I ask a question? You sure can. Uh, is there ever a point where the intake for either the pressure system or the uh, sitting well gets clogged? Yes, uh, it's possible for that to happen. So I was going to talk a little bit in a couple slides down the road about uh, about maintenance that we do to keep these things operating and, and how we confirm that the equipment is working properly. So that's a great question. Uh, but yes, that can happen. And we do have a routine maintenance that we perform on all these to make sure they're working. So let's actually that and that kind of is a great segue into the next slide. So one thing that the USGS mandates nationwide, and there, there's USGS in every state, this is not a, a New York specific agency. Um, we are mandated to confirm that our data logger is recording data correctly. So for example, if we go out and, and you look on the web and you see that the gauge height or the water level stage, all, all interchangeable terms, are, if it looks like it's reading five feet, we want to make sure that it actually is reading five feet. And so we, we have what we call reference gauges. So this is a staff gauge. It looks like a ruler that's in the water. Uh, and basically what we do is we come out here and we install this and we survey this to known elevations. And this is, um, this is what I call our reference gauge because when we set up our data logger, we, we set the values that the data logger reads according to this known surveyed instrument. So it, it, this is, it's not digital, it's, it's not mechanical, it's just a ruler on the side of the bridge. I call it a ruler, it's a staff gauge. But it's a surveyed instrument. And so all of our recording instruments are referenced to this, hence this is a, a reference gauge. And the same thing is true over here. So this is what we call a wire weight gauge. And this is also a reference gauge and it's a surveyed gauge. And so this sits on the side of a bridge and it literally has a spool of wire and it's all calibrated and it has a, a weight on it. And we lower the weight down. And if it's on a bridge like this, we lower the weight down until it touches the water surface. And then we have a readout on the instrument that tells us what the water surface is. Now, this is a reference gauge because we come in and we survey the elevation of the weight when it's down low. So we know for certain that this is reading accurately because we survey it. Uh, we, I don't wanna say we don't know with certainty that our recorder is reading right, but in order to verify that our recorder is reading right, we, we compare it to what we know with certainty and we know this is correct because it's conserved. Mm -hmm. So if there's ever a difference between our recorder and our reference gauge, we would fix, we would, we, first of all, we'd troubleshoot to see if there's any issue that, that makes them read differently. But assuming that it's just drifting, uh, we would then correct our recorder to read the same thing as our reference gauge. Uh, and that's why we have these out here. In addition to correcting and verifying our normal everyday readings, you know, the, the one piece of information that, that is always a hot button inf piece of information is the, uh, is the annual peak water level and discharge that we, uh, that we measure at our gauges. And in the case of these gauges being considered from a Marinec, uh, these are water level only. So there's no flow, there's no discharge that we're measuring. So they're just water level. And we have these instruments here called press stage gauges or CSGs. And these, these are actually fairly low tech instruments, but they work like a champ. And I'll, I'll try to describe how they work here. So this is basically a two inch pipe that's mounted to the wall. <clears throat> at the bottom, there's a cap. And at the, at the top of the pipe, there's a cap. Both of those caps are perforated. So water can, can go inside the pipe. And, in the, and this bottom cap is surveyed, so we know the elevation of this bottom cap. Inside the pipe, we have a one by two 
stick. <laughs> Essentially, it's a crest age gauge stick, very simple. And in the bottom of the cap, what we do is we put this very fine granulated cork. It's like, it's almost like dust. And so when the water level rises and it, you know, because this is perforated, the water enters the pipe. Let's say the water gets up to this line right here. What'll happen is the cork that's in the CSG and the crest age gauge will, will float. Right? And when the water recedes and the water leaves the pipe, it will leave a, a cork line on the stick that's inside this pipe. And so what we do every time we come out to the gauge, we pull this stick physically out of the pipe and we can measure the distance from the surveyed cap to the cork line. And we know by an alternate means how high the water got. And then that will help us to confirm our annual peak recorded gauge height at our gauges. So this is pretty much, it, it's mandated by USGS policy that we confirm our annual recorded peak. And this is by far the most common way that most offices do it, including New York. So this is, this is a crest age gauge. Every one of our sites has one of these uh, and it's an independent verification of our peak stage. Does that make sense? And it, it, yeah. it's super, it's super low tech, and I could show you no, a picture, really a picture of how it works. But it's, it's, it, they are very, very accurate. Egyptian so, technology. Yeah, there you go. Right. So this, in summary, this is, this is just another picture, and I'll, I'll move on to, to, to things after this. But this is a, this is a crust stage gauge at a site that was recently installed, maybe a year ago. This is a wire weight gauge, and this is the, the end of the pressure line as it terminates in the river. Uh, and so there's a cap here. And if, if we were up close, you'd actually see little air bubbles. You can't see them in this picture, but you'd see air bubbles pushing out of here periodically from that compressor. Is, and, there, is, there, that, a screen, is there a screen on the end of that or is it just open? Uh, no, no, there, there's, there's a cap that goes on the end of this. Some of them are metal, some of them are plastic, but nonetheless, it has a tiny little hole. You couldn't even push, you could push like a pipe cleaner in it, that kind of thing. And so it, 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 it's intended specifically for this application. So if we do have sites that tend to get sediment in them, uh, that yeah. could, like, like to answer your question before, did these ever get um, kind of, um, did they get covered in debris? Yes, they can. Yeah. Okay. And so we have, if we have sites that tend to be very silty sites, we can put this, it's hard to describe, but it basically looks like a turtle shell on the end of one of these lines and it helps um, the debris stay out of the end of the cap. Also, if we have sites that are very turbulent, you know, and you have a lot of wavy water, it helps still that water. Uh, so we get a, we get a, a better, more, less noisy trace of data. We, we, we definitely have a lot of silt. Yeah, so that's something we would evaluate as far as what we want to put on the end of that line um, uh, to keep the silt from, from kind of buggering up the end of this thing, yeah. Andrew, can you tell us where this location is? And as you move along with the presentation, can you give us examples of where uh, this kind of equipment has been installed and how it's working? I, I can, yeah. I, um, this particular picture, I'd have to go back to my archives. Anytime I see a, a good representative picture of some installs, I, I like to grab that as an example. So off the top of my head, I'd have to look back in our, in our archives to see where I pulled this picture from. But a lot of these pictures are sites that were installed about two years ago on, on rivers that are tributary to Lake Erie. Uh, and this is one of those sites, I just can't remember the specific location of this picture. But I, I do have a map that I'll show that shows all of our gauges and where they are throughout the state. And then I have a map that, that's, um, that you can access, anybody can access it that shows gauges throughout the country. Um, and so we'll, we'll take a look at that here in a minute as well. So we talked about uh, operation and maintenance and what's included and what do we do, uh, first of all, to keep make sure our gauges work right. But then what do we do to make sure over the long haul they continue to work properly? So what we do is once the gauge is installed and operational, we visit it every approximately eight weeks, plus or minus, every two months. And we, and we do routine servicing on the gauge. That means we read the data loggers, we read our reference gauges, we make sure everything's high and tight as far as the install, nothing is shifted or moved. Um, we come out and we do uh, special inspections as needed. So for example, uh, you had mentioned some of the debris that collects on these, these sensors in the river. Uh, if we get debris on a sensor, typically we would start to notice it on the data that you see online. The data may be, start to become a little more noisy or it may become a little more jumpy. And so that would cause us to go out and service that, that sensor that's in the river. 
Um, so that would be a special inspection. Uh, inevitably, electronics sometimes have little gremlins and glitches, so we would go out there and we would troubleshoot any electronic issues that we have. Uh, sometimes, you know, we're transmitting via GOES, so sometimes we'll have a cable issue. Um, anyhow, the point is we go out there with on special trips as needed, um, and we can see right away if the gauge goes down on the web, you'll see right away that the gauge is down and we, we uh, hightail it out there. Uh, we also do troubleshooting and equipment upgrades, and these, these this is all part of O&M, so there's no added expense for equipment upgrades. Uh, if we, um, you know, if, if there's a data logger that fails and we have to replace it, we do, you know, there's no passing costs along, that's all included in O&M. And we do, we do swap out our equipment, you know, fair amount to upgrade it and to keep it operational. And then we, uh, we do routine maintenance, including surveying, like you can see in the picture here. So one thing, one thing we want to ensure is that our, our reference gauges and all our equipment is not moving, right? So if you if your sensor in the river moves, then it, it throws into question the data that it collects. So we want to make sure it's stable as well as our reference marks and our, our reference gauges. And so we go out here and we set RPs, which is a reference point and reference marks, and, and we survey our reference gauges uh, every year for the first three years. And then once we determine that all the marks are stable, then we survey all of our gauges every three years. So that's part of the routine maintenance that, that is part of the O&M uh, that, that is covered. And talking about real-time data, uh, if you are familiar with USGS data, then you've seen these plots before. If you're not, then we can step through some of this. This is a gauge on Hempstead Lake. This is on Long Island. Uh, so I just used it as an example here. But if you're familiar with USGS data, you've probably seen a plot like this. This is just water level. On the left vertical axis, this is uh, elevation, lake elevation. Uh, if this was a riverine site, this would be what we call gauge height or stage, which is water level. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the bottom, of course, is your is your time step. And um, this is what we call our legacy page. So all of our pages, all our web pages are maintained at a national level. The data that we produce on the web page, we, we determine what goes on the, the web page. But as far as the maintenance of the web page, that's done on a national level. And the USGS is moving to what they call a next gen web page. And so that's what's pictured here on the right. That it's displaying the same exact data. Uh, except for this is a newer page that has different features that this cannot accommodate, the legacy page. Uh, and, you know, security risks, et cetera, have forced them to sort of to look forward into, into this next gen um, web page as it appears here. So these pages, these legacy pages are still available and you'll still see them on the web. They're going to be fully decommissioned in July of 2023 next year. Uh, and these next gen pages are what you will be redirected to if you go search for USGS gauge. This is what you'll find on the web, these next gen pages. There is a link right up here and we can go to a real time page if you wanna see it. There is a link here for legacy page. And if you click that link, it will step you back to this legacy page, which is, is familiar to a lot of users because this is what's been in place for, for many years. Um, anyhow, with the new page, you can you can look at all the same data you can look at multiple plots. And we again, I, what I, what I want to do is I want to pull up this gauge right here. This is the Bronx River. So mm -hmm. it's not too far from where you are. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this site, but we can look at this mm -hmm. uh, and, and check out what you can do on the, on the new next gen page. I figured I'd go through the rest of the slides here and then we could, we could pull that up. Now, one thing that a lot of users, and I know, uh, I shouldn't say I know, but I suspect you might have interest in it, for particularly for flood monitoring is this program called Water Alert. So this has been around for many years and it's been, it's been um, integrated into the new next gen page. And basically what Water Alert is, is it's an automated system that will send a user either a, an, a text on their cell phone or an email when a certain user defined threshold is exceeded. So for example, if you're looking at, again, this is, this is Hempstead Lake, so maybe not the best example, but nonetheless, we'll go with it. If you wanna know when Hempstead Lake gets above 18.6 feet, you can set up a water alert for 18.6 feet. And anytime that threshold is exceeded, whether high or low, uh, it will send you the system, water alert will send you a message. Um, and, and this is totally user-defined. So the USGS does not define this, you as the user 
define this. Maybe a homeowner might be, have interest if they live along a river of a certain gauge height that's of interest to them. Um, anyhow, I'll, I'll step through how to set up a water alert here. And if we want to do it together on, a, on an actual real-time page, we can do that. Uh, but when you're on our next gen page, any parameter that you can see in real time, you can set up a water alert for. So, so Hempstead Lake is just a water level site, much like the Mamaroneck sites would be. So the only water alert you can set up is one for water level. But for example, the Bronx River site that we can look at later, that has water level, it has discharge flow rate, it has um, a whole host of water quality parameters as well. So if you wanna set up a water alert based on any of those parameters, you can do it. So if you wanna know when the flow reaches a thousand cubic feet per second, you can set up that as a water alert and you'll get a notification. In this case, and in the case of the proposed gauges, it would just be water level because they're, they're just water level gauges. So you would need to create an account and log in to water alert in order to use this, but it's a fairly simple process. And, and this is how you do it. From the next gen page, you would, let me go back there. From the next gen page, you would click, you would, you would select the parameter you're interested in, in this case, water level. You'd click subscribe to alerts and it would take you to this page right here. It shows that you're signed in and it shows you what, what site we're at, what location. And now you wanna create an alert for this location. And here's where you set up the criteria and the thresholds that you're interested in. So for example, if you're interested in water level more than greater than five feet, you would put a five here and it would show you a little, a little graph here, but you put in five feet. If you wanted to see a water level of less than a certain amount, like for example, when a re reservoir gets really low and you're, you have concerns about you know, an intake going out of water, let's say, something like that, you could set up a threshold below a certain level. Or if you wanted to know, this is just a screen capture, so I can't click any, oops, this is a, so I can't click anything here. But mm -hmm. if you wanted to know a water level between two values, I wanna know when the water level is between five and eight feet. You could click this value, this box right here, and you could choose the lower boundary and the upper boundary of what you're looking for. And then you select how often you want to be notified. You want to be notified daily when this threshold is exceeded, or you want to be notified every hour. You can select that, and then you select how you want to be notified, your email address or your cell phone number. And so you would get those automated alerts based on however you set up the criteria here. You would click create alert and and that's that, and you'd be all set. And any, so if you wanted to be alerted based on water level, let's say your stage had water level, like bronze, let's say it had water level, it had discharge, and it had multiple water quality parameters. If you wanted to be alerted for multiple things, you'd have to set up a water alert for each parameter you're interested in. But again, the process is similar. So, so we'll come back to the water alert thing when, when we start looking at some of the site specific things that may be of interest. So these are the gauges. When I, when I met with, with Jerry and other folks uh, at the village a couple months ago now, I think, uh, we talked about gauges that might be of interest for flood monitoring. And these are the sites that were chosen. So we have Mamaroneck at the Mamaroneck Dam up here. We have Beaver Swamp Brook, which is behind the, the Rhineck High School. We have Sheldrake at Fenimore, which I believe that's village property at the, at the, at the DPW facility. And then we have a Mamaroneck River at Mamaroneck. And I forget the road that this is on, but it's, um, we can zoom in and, and take a look at that. Uh, but nonetheless, we have four gauges that have been selected. Uh, and whenever we install a gauge on anybody's property, whether it's private property or village or city or federal property, we always try to, we have to secure permission to install. And so in anticipation of this being approved, we've gone through and we've started the permission process. And right now we have permission secured at three of the four sites. Um, we don't have permission yet at Mamaroneck River at Mamaroneck, but we're working on that and hopefully we'll have permission for that soon to install. We do have all the equipment in-house uh, ready to go and ready to install should this be approved. So uh, if we get the green light on this, three out of the four of these could be installed in fairly short order. <clears throat> So when you say that you could get an alert, uh, you said every hour, every hour, every day, can you get yep. it every 15 minutes? Uh, I think the, sh yeah, I think the shortest time frame. that's a great question. I think the shortest time frame allowed is, is hourly. 
um, yeah, which is unfortunate. It would be nice to get a water alert quicker than that, but I think it's only hourly. And the reason for that is because typically we only transmit data hourly, right? If you, if you wanted to get a water alert every 15 minutes, and yet we're not going to transmit data for an hour, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't make sense to do that. So I think the reason that the hour is the, the shortest time frame is because that's typically how we transmit data. And, and, and we, we don't get data in the database and on the web any sooner than an hour. Uh, having said that, for these sites here, we're talking about having 15 minute transmits. Um, I, I will have to look into it. I don't believe the option exists though. I think it's only hourly. Well, so Andy, before you proceed and, and we have to- sure. Well, yeah. your, your, your 0130-1000. Yes. Is that, is the landowner, the, the, the Metro North, is it the MTA? This is, um, the, I, I, I can pull up a Google Earth map. Right, we, we, can, we can do that tomorrow. We can do that offline because okay. it's going to take an act of God to get them to give you permission. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, this is, so two of these, um, let me take a step back. This site here, 0130-1000, we used to have, uh, so if you remember the whole crest age gauge with the stick and the cork, we have been funded in the past and, and several of our sites, um, some of our cooperators are only interested in the annual peak stage and the annual peak discharge. That's the only piece of information they want from a gauge. And so this gauge here, uh, we used to have, it was a, what we call a CSG only or a, a peak stage only gauge. And so we formerly had a crest age gauge here that measured just the annual peak stage and just the annual peak discharge. So that's where we're looking to reoccupy. We're looking to actually, so, so we were at this location, we were about, uh, I'm guessing about 50 feet downstream of a bridge. Uh, and the, the, the private landowner there is hesitant to, to let us put any equipment there like a full blown gauging station. So we're looking to move up towards the bridge and we're working with property owners there. And, and so, so Jerry, you and I can talk about that afterwards okay. if, if there's any, yeah, any way we can. And I apologize. I want the board of trustees to ask as many questions as they want. I just needed to bring that up before I forgot. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, please do. Thank you. I appreciate that. So going back to water alert, um, these are things that, you know, again, the USGS doesn't determine the threshold that's that the user determines that, but some things that may be of interest. I just picked two sites here. For, for example, the Mamaroneck Dam. Uh, if, if, if this gets approved and we install this gauge, this would be the gauge house itself and the sensor would be located probably, I'm guessing 75 feet upstream of this dam. Mm -hmm. So you as a, a user or you as someone maybe monitoring flooding conditions may be interested in different water levels. For example, you may be interested in when these openings in the dam are, are, are overtopped. You may be interested in the elevation of the top of the dam or maybe the top of the flashboards. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you'd be interested in when the water level gets two feet before it overtops the dam. So there's a whole bunch of different things you can look at. Uh, Sheldrake River, this is the one that would be installed in this vicinity uh, at, on village property behind the, I'll call it the DPW facility. You may be interested the salt here. Shed. The salt shed. Okay. There you go. Okay, the salt shed, yep. You may be interested here, and again, this is something that needs to be determined, but you may be interested in the top of the bank where water overtops the bank. Uh, if, if this gauge gets installed, the water level sensor would be somewhere up in this area, and you may be interested in when water overtops the bank. And if we look downstream from here, that's this is the bridge downstream from there, you may be interested in when water hits the low concrete here or maybe a foot or two before it hits the concrete. So these are all things you can think about when trying to figure out what water alert to establish. If, if you're to use the water alert program, it's certainly not mandatory, but it may be of interest. And these are some of the things you may consider. Um, now, normally when we, when we install a gauge, we don't necessarily survey all these elevations here, but if there's interest and you guys uh, are, if you say, geez, Andy, you know, the top of the dam, you probably have an elevation of that, but maybe maybe you don't have an elevation of the top of the gate openings. And if you want that, that's something we could incorporate into the installation so that you could use that or or some variation of that to determine a water alert threshold that might be of interest. You know, we could shoot with a survey gun the underside of the concrete of the bridge. And again, you can determine if that's an elevation you want to use or or, or not. Uh, so so these are all things that that can be determined. You know, but these are just two examples of the sites. I don't have pictures of the other sites here. 
um, but things to think about. Mm -hmm. and, and again, we can talk more about water alert if you want to, we can talk more about the real time data, but just to show a map of where our current gauges are throughout the state. This is just a, a Google Earth screen capture. Can of you a, some questions? <coughs> Sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, please, yes. Yeah, the, the primary purpose of this is as an early warning system. Mm -hmm. all, all the other information, why, which is desirable and helpful for, you know, for cataloging and in, in future planning, is interesting and helpful, but doesn't get to the core of how this comes up as terms of an early warning system. So there are several questions I have. First of all, you're saying that you will get you can get multiple, if I understand you correctly, you can get multiple alerts, but only once an hour. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. I, I can I can talk to our national folks and see if that's customizable at anything less than an hour, but I do, at, at this time I don't believe it is. I so think that's in, correct. In a situation like either, that would be of no value. Because by the time the second the, the, the second hour came, minutes. you're already you're already flooded. Well, one thing, so, one thing. So the question, let me finish if I may. I'm sorry. Yep, I'm sorry. So the Here's question a preamble. really is how to re, how this could be set up in a way that you that goes to more than one water level. So let's assume for the sake of discussion, we say uh, we want to know if it gets to X, which is you know a concern. But if it gets to X, if it gets to Y. You know, that's a high probability of flooding in the village and still mm -hmm. gives us, you know, some time to, you know, seek uh, approaches. The question is, can this system be work rigged either, you know, through the di different, um, we have four gauges. The question is, can you get a four different alerts from the four different gauges? Because then you can set one for, you know, one hour and one, you know, an hour and 10 minutes and nothing else, 10 minutes, you know, so because it's, you know, that that would be one way of doing it if it could be done. I don't know. This is your system, not ours. Um, yep, yep. And can, I, can I just add to, add to what uh, the trustee is saying? Do you usually set these this close to each other? Uh, you're talking physical gauge installation location? Yeah, because in some places you're less than half a mile. Yeah, um, it all depends on user needs. So these are sites that when I when I met with the village, these are sites that were selected by several folks as far as sort of the maybe the pinch points or the or the areas of most concern. So um, you know, it, it's it's based on user need and and cooperator needs. So if there's a need for these in those locations, that's why that's why we went and and selected these along with the, the village folks, yeah. Uh, did, did he answer your question? I'm sorry, I jumped in there. Well, no, he hasn't answered my question. Yeah, yeah. so as far, as far as water alerts, you should be able to set up multiple water alerts. So for example, if you set up a water alert for five feet, um, you could also set up another alert, water alert for 5.5 feet uh, if you wanna know when that 5.5 5 okay. feet is, is exceeded. So, so the next the follow up to that is, if you're saying that every individual, we have uh, you know, 20,000 people, let's mm -hmm. assume 10,000 of them want to get into this, or 1,000, I don't care. You're saying each one of them has to set up all these parameters individually? Or can it be set up, can the village set up a global and if they, and give the option to those who want to be more specific, you know, and set their own uh, to do so? Or is it, you know, is it one for, is it one setting for everybody or is it, you know, and if so, the village should be doing that uh, as opposed to every individual, you know, mm -hmm. logging in. I mean, you know, I know on off and sledgehammer when it comes to, you know, phones uh, you know, and the, we would want, you know, more of a phone alert than a email alert, uh, you know, unless the email goes to your phone. Mm -hmm. so it, the whole concept of this is an early warning system. And right. I, I understand the information gathering, which is important. The question is how to manipulate it to be a real early warning system. Right. In real time, not, not uh, you know, hours right. and hours away from each other. If I can expand on what Dan, Dan is saying there, Andrew, um, this is uh, Lou Young. Uh, sure. I think 
what we need is uh, once we get an alert to be able to um, uh, uh, contact these gauges and find out what's happening at these different locations in real time. Is that is that doable? Uh, the way these gauges are set up, we, there are some sites that have um, different telemetry systems. So this this system in this gauge is a, is a GOES transmitter. So it's a satellite transmitter. So it's one way communication. We, there's no way for you to dial in or call in or connect to the gauge. Uh, so it's, it's one way communication from the gauge to the, the web, basically to our, our network. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question on that. But as far as the water alert goes, the alerts are specific to the, the login ID and password, right? So if, if I, so for example, we could look at the same gauge and, and I may be interested in a water level of five feet and, the, and you as someone with the village may be interested in a water level of four feet. Well, it's going to send me a water alert when, according to my username and ID that I plugged in there at, at my user defined threshold. And it's going to do the same thing for you at your user defined threshold. So it's, it is all dependent on the login that's used to, to get the alert. Um, so if, if you as, let's say the village wanted to make some sort of um, warning known to the, to the, to the village, uh, you, you know, you could collect a water alert at a certain water level. And then, uh, you know, I, I think I think someone maybe on the board had spoken with someone else in my office uh, named Gary Wall. Uh, he and I have been talking about this too. And there's a possibility, you know, this is not something the USGS does, but it's a possibility that you could set up some sort of reverse 911 system. And again, that's that's not something that the USGS has their hand in, but it's something that could be considered. Um, and if that could be implemented, maybe it could be used that way. Yeah, I'm just I'm just concerned about the the gaps in the information. Yeah. Once we have an emergency, we're going to need real time, moment to moment um, information on what's happening in those rivers. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't you can't wait 15 minutes or, or an hour. Everything could sure. change in a, in a few minutes. Sure. I mean, I can tell you this from the years I've been here. And there's people in a room that could testify to this, and there's multiple firemen uh, and police officers who have seen it over the years. Once the dam is topped. You got about 15 minutes before Washington Bills flooded. Gotcha. Uh, so I mean, I, I, I so I, I guess you know my my, my I, there's, there's there's a lot of bells, buzzes, and whistles, and I, I I don't know if they're needed and if we just need you know like a like a couple of uh, you know markers here. That you know, there's, you know, at at, at, su at such and such a rate, you know, you got 20 minutes, 30 minutes before the, uh, you know, at, we we usually station a fire uh, department member there, and mm -hmm. he gives us a you know a, a visual on uh, you know how far it is above the top of the dam with Tony Acavelli or somebody like that, and you know you could hear on the radio once once it goes over the top of the dam. Yeah. You know it. it you know, the party's over. So I, I, I go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. Hmm. I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, the the one thing that's difficult is what you're describing is a rate of change, right? So yeah. our water alert doesn't do a rate of change. It just gives you water level exceeding a threshold. So, for example, if you look at you know, obviously the the magnitude of flooding is highly dependent on the intensity of the rainfall. So if you have a three inch rainfall in four hours or a three inch rainfall over four days, the, the effect on the rivers could be dramatically different, right? Where, where a high intensity, short duration rainfall is gonna create a, a really sharp rise and a sharp spike yeah. in the peak. So it, it is very different. And the water alert does not accommodate a, rain, a rate of change uh, notification. That would be nice if it did. One thing that we can do and we have done is and again, this is this is something that that is more of a visual from looking at the web. But we can put um, lines, so you, you can set up this whole water alert thing. But we can also put uh, something on the web that appears, for example, in this in this picture right here. Uh, if we knew the elevation uh, of the bottom of this bridge, let's say, we could put an indicator on the web so that as the water's rising, a line would appear on the plot that shows you know, low steel or low concrete of the bridge. And you could see based on, on the intensity of the rise, if it's a really sharp rise or more of a broad rise, 
you can see if it's anticipated to hit this. Um, but the intensity of the storm has a lot to play. You know, for example, a, 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 again, a water alert of five feet may mean something if you have a high intensity storm, but it may not be quite as critical if you have a low intensity storm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? As far as stretched out mm -hmm. over three days. Okay. Can you continue with the, do you have more presentation? Uh, just a couple more slides and then and then we can keep on with the questions. But, you know, I, I know, uh, I think Jerry had mentioned there was some interest in the, the breadth of the gauging network in New York. So mm -hmm. nationally, there's about 8,000 gauges. In New York, we have about 300 gauges that measure water level and flow. We also have these peak stage and flow gauges. We have lakes and reservoirs, tide gauges, groundwater wells, et cetera. So you can see here uh, that we have hundreds of gauges across the state. So I know there was a question about, about other gauges that other agents, not other agencies, but other entities um, fund uh, other other um, municipalities, et cetera. So this is the, the breadth of the network here in New York. There are gauges that aren't plotted on here, but this is the vast majority of them. And then, and then, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. And you install gauges only uh, uh, on request uh, when they're funded by somebody? Generally, yes. So we do have, um, the answer to the question is yes with an asterisk. So generally we install gauges when there's a customer need for some reason. Um, we also install, so the federal government has what they call a federal priority stream gauge network. Uh, and there are certain criteria that a location would need to meet or a stream gauge site would need to meet in order to uh, be applicable uh, to this federal priority stream gauge network. And then we get federal funding to install those gauges. But by and large, the gauges that we have are funded by independent co-op. We call them cooperators. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then, and I think this may be close to the last slide. This is the network of gauges throughout the country. And I was going to show you this website because if you're interested in other gauges that are nearby, you can go to this website. This is a, a mapper of all the gauges in, in, the, in the country. And you can look at sites that are active sites, or you can look at sites that are inactive sites, meaning they have some sort of data, but they're no longer funded to be operational. And so this is what it looks like. And, and I believe the last slide is this one here. So we're of course looking at Mamaroneck and you can see anywhere that there's a stickum, there are other gauges nearby. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that it's a water level gauge or a discharge gauge. It could be that there are water quality samples at gauges from 20 years ago. It could be, actually, these are all active gauges. So they're, there is some sort of recent data at all these gauges. It doesn't mean water level and discharge. Like I said, it could mean that there was a, uh, an independent water quality sample taken. But anyway, in the mapper, if you go to that mapper, you can click on any one of these and you can see what data are available. So there were some, again, there were some questions or I thought there, were, there might be some questions about other, other gauges that we have in the network nearby. So yeah. you, part you can- of, Andrew, part of that was the, the interest in to see uh, immediately upriver from us, upriver both rivers. Yep. Um, if there were any gauges that we could um, uh, leverage, utilize, and monitor, you know, and and assist us in in uh, the, sure. uh, you know, the the on the the onset of, of flooding. So mm -hmm. it doesn't mm -hmm. look like there's much, except for the Port Chester Rybrook area right along mm -hmm. the Connecticut NY line and yep. one in East Chester. Maybe. Yeah, I, I bet those aren't flood gauges. I don't they, know. Yeah, they, they very well may not be. And again, this is a screen capture, so I can't I can't click on this. But if you go to that website, you can click on any one of these and see what data are available. And and it, it's it's very variable. It's very variable as far as what data are collected for so, at a certain location and for what purpose. So there's a lot in Jersey, right? Right over right over. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yep. Again, some of those might be riverine gauges. Some of those may be water quality samples. Some of those may be lake gauges. It all, it all depends. If you click, if you go to the link and you click the little icon here, you can find more information. Okay. Another question. So, so I have, yes. I have my uh, with me. Do I have to log in every time I want to get, see what get an alert, or do I log in once, set my parameters, and it will automatically you know, send me information. The answer is you do not need to log in every time. Once you're logged in, you would stay logged in. But once you're logged in, as long as that threshold is 
is set up and and active, you'll get a notification every time. And and if for some reason you didn't want to be, you wanted to keep the threshold in place, but for some reason you you know over this month you're going to be away and you don't want to be you don't want to be alerted, you can shut that notification off. Uh, for a certain, there's like a little toggle where you can turn yes. the notification on and off. But w once you're logged in, it will continually send the updates as long as as long as the water alerts active. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> Not from my end. No. Are there any other questions? Other questions? Uh, I think I've got a good uh, picture of what what is what they're offering. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Just, just to, to complete, to get the full picture um, on, on the cost, on the, how is this structured? Very simple because we got some backup, but there, was, there were questions uh, on, on the, essentially the, the property, the, this devices are your property. How long does it take? How long is the contract for? How many units? Just, just very basic, the breakdown. Yeah, I don't have I don't have the funding in front of me, but I can give you an idea. So we so each the funding that was the funding agreement that was submitted was for all four gauges. Actually, the initial funding agreement was for three gauges because that's all that was needed at the time. But once we did some site visits, it was determined that a fourth gauge would be beneficial. So we, we the initial agreement that we submitted was for the installation uh, of three gauges and the operation and maintenance of those gauges for five years. Uh, the, we submitted an amendment, um, and that amendment was for the fourth gauge for installation and operation and maintenance for five years. Does that, does that answer your question, or do you need more specific than that? Good enough for that. Thank you. Okay. Yep, sure. Thank you. Andrew, yep. thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank Glad you. to be part of it. Thank you. <laughs> yep. All right. Take, thank you. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, we, we also uh, have information, I think, from the, uh, the head of the uh, Flood Mitigation Advisory Committee about some research he's done about flood uh, gauges uh, exclusive of this. Jerry, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? I saw some stuff, um, Mayor, from uh, Tony, yeah. but I didn't, I didn't look into it. Um, I didn't have time to look into it. No, neither there, was some, there was some information that he provided as far as uh, alternatives, but what, what I've learned from, from Andrew's presentation is the, I think the board may want to really focus and, and, and hone in on the frequency of the reporting, yeah. if there's anything out there on the market like that. So yeah, Because our intervals doesn't really cut it here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if we set up gauges and we set up parameters where, you know, we know that we're getting into a dangerous area, maybe that should be communicated to the public as opposed to having the public um, work online or work on in a web-based platform where they set up their own heights or, or parameters. So right. I think I have to look at that more than anything else. And that's why I needed Andrews because we never got into the, the real deep dive with Andrew. We, Never no, we haven't. Would, no. would this be something that we do an RFP for? It potentially, potentially we'd have to do uh, because of the cost. I mean, you know, we can probably, um, we can probably look at that kind of, uh, of uh, use that scope to try to see if anyone would respond to what we're asking them to do. That would yeah, be what we're, what we're looking for may cost more than, than what they're charging by, but you know, uh, no, 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 I don't think this is it. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd rather I'd, I'd pay more for something that works. Yeah, something that 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 can give us what we want. So crazy. I think it may be beneficial for the uh, for us to look into what potentially would be more along the lines of of those uh, of of those features. Let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah, we we need something that gives us. Jerry, immediacy. Have, have you explored with USGS whether they know of a system that does this, even if they don't? I haven't. I haven't explored. I can ask. Of course, I'm going to have to talk to Andy at some point based on what the board's directive directive is uh, to me. But um, I have well, not, and I, and I can, of course, if you want me to. But I haven't. Well, he, he wasn't clear as to whether you can do it more than one hour. I think he was. I think yeah, he said. No, he, 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 I think he's really he clear about that. 
said he didn't think so, but yeah. you have to check. Um, I, I, I would hope that we could put out an RFP for this and so get want, something. We want reporting. We're frequent, right? 15 minute reporting intervals. No, I'd, I'd like immediacy. I'd, okay. I'd like to be able to, it, it, like to, be able we, to dial it up and, and yeah. see what the, how deep the water is at the dam right now. If, if okay. we own the equipment, right? Then, you know, the fire chiefs and the, the village manager and the police chief okay. could all get, hey, you know, you got, and, you know, we could figure this out. You got 20 minutes, you got a half an hour, you got an hour before you're in real trouble. But okay. if the equipment only takes readings every so often, there that I I think we have to find out a little bit more about what's available before that, that, we, yes, before yeah, we exactly, structure that's an RFP. exactly what we're talking about. But, but before we structure an RFP, it's, it's going to take a little bit more. Um, yeah. yeah more. What what's his name? You know, uh, we'll see what Tony's Tony got. Tony's done some work, and I'll, I'll send it to everybody if you didn't get it. No, he, he has, but but honestly, I can't I can't remember because I didn't look in real real hard at what he sent. I did review quickly. No, neither did I. He sent this he, afternoon. If it meets, if it meets that, no, I think he had something before that too that he was kind of talking about, but I'm not sure. The flood, the flood mitigation committee was going to talk about it, but their meeting was tonight, so they canceled their meeting. So I guess they don't meet for another month. Tony, Tony Sorry. said he might, he might be setting a meeting up next week. Okay, it's, okay, it's not on the calendar yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, but I know, I don't know what Tony said today, but a couple of weeks ago was a company that makes equipment, but they don't do it, they don't install it. And you'd have to get it, they said you'd have to get an engineer and you'd have to try and figure out what you want. Sure. We need something similar to a security camera where you can dial in and take a look yeah. at what's going yeah. on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. All right. All right. Sorry it took so long, but you know, better that we check before we went and did it. Well, we're talking about big money, so we had to kind of do it. Yeah, big money, yeah. All right, uh, fair and affordable housing. I don't think we have time to get through that tonight. No, well, and, and I know I understand why you put it on the agenda. Yeah, I yeah. And I, um, I just briefly, I think it's I think it's something that should be included, and in, I'm sure it is going to be included in the comp plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had followed up with West Ham, so we can talk about that in two weeks. But okay. we, um, but we do have people I think who are here to talk about the dog park. I'm yeah, that's what I was going to go. Yeah, I think that's Thanks. what we should be doing. Uh, no, we're here to talk about the bill, but this is this is the Board of Trustees work session. Uh, mm -hmm. Wetlands War, that's for October 11th. Mm -hmm. Next up is the dog park. We, we have a proposal for a dog park that's currently located next to the uh, sewage treatment plant. Uh, if you're looking at the sewage treatment plant to the right of it, uh, that is in front of the Harbor Coastal Zone Management Commission right now. Uh, the rec commission, I believe, and the dog park. Uh, what was it? It's, it's a subcommittee. Work. Subcommittee, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. No, no, I, I got it. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> and the dog park subcommittee have now recommended uh, over on uh, oh, Rushmore. 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 Thank you. I'm losing it tonight. Over on Rushmore Avenue, uh, putting it over there. Okay. Uh, I, I can give you my view of this. Uh, Rushmore Avenue is an area that has always been kind of kept in Harbor Island Park for passive recreation. It's where people can go and walk, sit in a bench, uh, and have quiet time. You know, the county spent a lot of money a few years ago to restore the wetlands uh, on the, uh, where, where the, the seawall ends and going down to the end of the Harbor Island property. Uh, it's actually an ex-mayor of the village of Mamaronek who got the county to do that when he worked for the county, Bob Funicello. And, you know, that, that's it's a critical environmental area. Now, we also don't have utilities there. We don't have uh, electricity. We don't have water. I spent a couple of years as chairman of the Coastal Zone Management Commission. Uh, as before as the Harbor Coastal Zone Management Commission. And I would say I was a pretty liberal chairman and I would have a hard time giving this a consistency recommendation based upon where it is, 
based upon the fact that that area floods all the way up to Rushmore Avenue, probably at once or twice a year. Uh, so, and I, while I understand the reasoning that the uh, rec board and the dog uh, subcommittee had for moving it, uh, where we had originally planned to put it is just an area where sometimes, you know, kids work out a little bit. It's not a field uh, and it, it probably never was going to be a field. But, you know, as far as disturbing other people who were playing, you know, we could regulate the hours of the dog park too. Uh, you know, maybe on Saturday and Sunday mornings, not have it uh, as available uh, when there's more kids down there. But I've been doing this a long time and there are issues and problems with every, every area that you, you, you wanna play something. You know, uh, 21 years ago, uh, we put the spray ground down on the beach in Harbor Island Park. And it was a, a big kerfuffle. And uh, a lot of people didn't want it on the beach, although it, it seemed to me a natural place to have the spray ground. Uh, people wanted it by the playground. Uh, people wanted it at Stanley Avenue Park. So I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, no matter where you try and cite something, there are always going to be difficulties. There are always going to be uh, issues. And where it's being cited now might not be the perfect spot, but there isn't a perfect spot in my, in my view. Um, so, you know, and, and we've, we've gotten a lot of uh, correspondence, both pro and con. We've got a lot of correspondence. We got a letter from the Orient to Point Association uh, about this too. And that part of the park, that, that little playground that's down there now, the little kitty playground, that was put in because Oriented doesn't have a, a neighborhood park. You know, the, the, just let me go through this. There are neighborhood parks and there are community parks. Stanley Avenue is a neighborhood park. Florence is a neighborhood park. Columbus is a neighborhood park. Uh, neighborhood parks don't have bathrooms. Uh, Harbor Island is a community park. It's the only park that is, uh, it's the only park that's, you know, for the whole community. Uh, so that, 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 that area of Rushmore, uh, the, the folks on that side of the community always looked at that as, you know, that little playground as, you know, the, the one little playground that they had, besides the ones they have in their backyard. So I, I have a hard time now moving that to that area for a multitude of reasons, but I, I think we'd have a really, really hard time getting a consistency determination from the Harbor Coast the Zone Management Commission. But that's that's my view of this. I'm open to listening to the rest of the board. Oh, I, I think what this is, is, uh, is opposition to the dog park uh, as it was originally um, uh, suggested. We, we got our recommendation from Parks and Rec. Um, the board, um, what you know, took it. And uh, we're, we're right at the end now. And I think people who don't want a dog park um, uh, uh, went to the Parks and Rec Committee instead of coming to us. And, uh, and I think that the, the ship is sailed. I can assure you that that's not what happened. No? Okay. That's not, that's, yeah, that's not what happened. So, so it was uh, driven so you, you, you were, let's just, let's yeah. just state yeah. the issue. Okay. Okay. So in, in any event, I, I just think it's, it's a matter of whether we're going to have a dog park there or not. I mean, because if you, if you start reciting it, you, 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 you're telling people we're not going to have a dog park for a couple of more years. That's it. So we're, you know, we're at that point now. We either do it or we don't. Uh, well, I think that's a little black and white. Um, right, and and I'm, I, I think we really should hear from the, from the members of the Park and Recs Committee who are also from the Ad Hoc Dog Park Committee. And I don't really want to speak for them. But what I will say is that um, we're, the whole... The reason, I mean, we're waiting now for the village to prepare documentation so HCZM can do its consistency determination. And that hasn't happened yet. So we're waiting on that. So that is, you know, the, and we also know that no matter when we get an approval, there's a supply chain issue. So the dog park isn't going to be built till the spring. So I don't think that changing the location is necessarily a showstopper. Um, and I and I'm not suggesting. I mean, I think the Rushmore is 
location is, I mean, I understand the appeal of the site versus the, the proposed site between the sewage treatment plant and the um, schoolhouse, but um, I think it's a much more complicated environmental lift and I don't think HCCM can, can find it consistent. I think there's just enough other problems with the site that it's not practical. Um, there have been other sites looked at and I actually think that we maybe should be thinking about um, the Greenhaven site, um, the Greenhaven Lane site, which- um, you know, Unit Taylor's site? No, no, Greenhaven Lane, right, behind Mangon. It's near Taylor's, it's near Taylor's Lane, but it's not the Taylor Lane. It's not the, it's not the, it's not the Taylor's Lane. It's all the far west end of the village, right? Well, you know, I mean, I'll tell you that, and I, I mean, I really think that this, that Tina and, and Tina Maresca and Carrie Sergio are here from Parks and the ad, uh, Parks and Rec and the Ad Hoc Committee. Um, and I think that they can talk about it. That I think this site was picked because they thought it would be up and running by May, 2021. And that was really, it wasn't the preferred site. It was just the expedient site. It certainly hasn't been expedient. And sometimes things happen for a reason. And you know this is this is a big endeavor for the village. It's an important endeavor for the village, and I think we have to really get this right. And you know, I mean, we are not a community that has our one big park is Harbor Island Park, and it's a very very busy park, and it's on the water, so it has you know it's a sensitive environmental area. The Harrison Dog Park and the Porchester Dog Park, which are the two most proximate to us, are simply. Able, they're located at a park that, um, at parks that were large enough to accommodate it. We simply don't have another park that can accommodate it the way those two parks can. So I, I really kind of would like to hear, I would like to hear. Mayor, may I address the board just as the chairperson? Please do, and then don't leave out, Rye has one over by the beach also. They don't actually have a dog park, they allow dogs in Off a leash. park. Yeah, but that's not, well, that happens at Rush, okay. right now on Rushmore. So it's a different look. Okay, please carry. Um, I'm Tina I'm sorry. It's I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> I knew that. No, no, no. Same personality, different color hair. Um, I'm <laughs> Tina Maresca. I'm the chairperson of the Parks and Rec Commission. And I sat on the dog park committee. Um, I just want to clarify, we all, even everybody that wasn't on the dog park committee want to see a dog park as quickly as possible. And we started this before the flooding and COVID. So we kind of got slowed down because of that. And um, thinking about things now, number one, I felt, I feel like the dog park committee should be expanded. It's not, there's three members from the rec, Parks and Rec, and then there's two community members. I would love to see additional community members put on the, the dog park committee because I think that, like in these lab in this past weekend, when everybody saw what was being proposed, we were able to talk to a lot of people, and Carrie can speak to it as well. Um, that I think would be so beneficial to have their input as well and things that we haven't thought of. But we don't think that if we reconvened and added a few members, we feel like we could do it quickly and that we could, by January, have it to the HCCM with a better location after you guys look at it and approve it. I don't think that it would take long because we are all eager to get this done. And we kind of, settled for better sake of words on the location next to the sewage treatment plant because we were made to believe that this was going to be the location that would be the quickest and easiest so although we took a lot of time to look around and try to find spots we're not familiar with every spot in the village so there's places that were it brought to our attention that now have been that we could have looked at and could have investigated. So I just feel like we need additional members and we need one more chance just to kind of find no place is going to be perfect, but I think having it in the middle of all these kids playing soccer and baseball is 
not a good place. And I don't know if you saw Dan Margosius's email he sent at four o'clock this afternoon. He is on the board of LMFC, the soccer league. I am as well. And I had originally spoken to them and gotten their okay that they would not mind if we took away that piece of grass. But now with the parks department going to be redoing little by little the fields at the harbor, which are like long, long, long overdue, um, they're gonna be closing down section at a time. So they're gonna be losing field space and I think that was part of where they were going to move them. To. Quick uh, question: uh, This uh, this soccer organization is it's um, uh, a village organization or it is correct. a private organization? It well, no, Dan. So Dan Margosius, who sent you the email, mm -hmm. he runs our recreation program for the soccer league, which are all village res <coughs> all village residents, and I would I would say probably eighty percent of them are low income families in the village okay. that really need to be out there playing soccer and LMFC provides them with so much. They give so many scholarships mm -hmm. and help these kids because it's like their only opportunity. Sure, and that's sure. really the cheapest option of any kind of sport in our community. So Tina, yes. to be clear, you're asking for a little bit more time to expand the committee. You have people whom you want are trying to suggest be on that committee? Well, so I think that was in my opinion, part of the problem. I don't know how normally you guys go about putting together an ad hoc committee, but like I didn't see it publicized. So I don't know how the committee members came about. I know normally since it's an ad hoc committee from the rec commission, mm -hmm. that's why I'm on it. That's why Carrie's on it and um, Cindy. So that part I know, but I don't know how the community piece comes into play. So like, I didn't see it advertised. Like maybe if somebody had known, they would say, oh, I would love to help investigate the dog well, So what I'm hearing is that you're not married to Rushmore. Yeah, okay, no, so no, no, no. We knew there was gonna be trouble, but okay. we were just trying to think with a clear mind and not, we knew that every location had a downfall. Sure. But we, you know, Everything aside, that's how we were trying to look at it. We were trying to look at what, in a perfect world, what the perfect place would be. So, in, in, in essence, um, we're, no, we got we're second not. second thoughts, cold yeah, feet about the. Of, I mean, I didn't see all of the emails that you guys saw, but yeah. I did see a lot of them. Yeah. And they're all valid concerns. Yeah. And I, at this point, would say no, I don't want it at Rushmore, but I also don't want it next to the treatment plant. Okay, so essentially we don't want an exit. They, they're saying they don't want an exit of treatment plant. That's the And more people. Correct. And to the village to advertise it. Uh, and, uh, put it yes, but I would say it needs to be done quickly. Jerry. Do you want to see it happen? Jerry. Uh, before, before we go down a road again, we need parameters of what is needed to provide a dog park. What, what, what do we have to provide? The parameters that we were going with next to the, um, and the details of the dog park next to the sewer plant uh, was a fenced in area, approximately one acre, cut in a portion or divided in a portion where a there would be a small dog park and then a larger dog park side by side. There would be ample parking, which is behind the sewer plant as soon as we get our contractors out of here and we reclaim all of that. And there would be water, uh, which was requested to kind of wash down the dogs if their paws were muddy before they get back into the SUVs, uh, those kinds of things. That's what we were looking for. So, so you would need parking? Parking, mm -hmm. utility, not necessarily electric, but we need some kind of water source. Well, if we're gonna use a key fob system like you suggested, Jerry, we would need Wi-Fi and electricity. No, no, they're battery operated, Tina. So oh. <laughs> They're battery operated uh, with uh, um, for one of those lithium batteries. So okay, okay. So I have I have, I have uh, experience in that. Um, parking water source. Do you, do you need a concrete pad? Do we need concrete pads because we need to wash down the dogs on a concrete pad? And then there would be um, uh, what? What? Wait up! Just let me finish my questions. What, what, how much 
area do we need to have a, because you've done dog parks before. I built a two and a half acre dog park. An acre would suffice. But anything smaller than an acre, it's on top of each other. Everything's on top of each other. So at least an acre. An another question, Jerry. Uh, if, um, if we were to send uh, the, um, the environmental stuff uh, for that location, um, let's say over to uh, HCZMC um, after the, you hire the engineer, a, and you went forward with that location, when could, you, uh, when could it be built? Is, is there a delay? Or would you be able to get it up uh, before the end of the year? Before the end of the year? Yeah. No. I don't, I don't know. I'm asking. So, so one thing. How quickly could you do it? The, the Harbor Coastal hasn't met in, in many months and continues to cancel meetings, so I have no idea. I really wasn't in favor of going to Harbor Coastal, just basically building, putting up the fence and creating a dog park. But if the board absolutely insists that we go to Harbor Coastal, you can add six months to this. To this well, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you're in a park that isn't by the water, you don't have to go to Harbor Coastal. Right. So, so that parking so, lot, when is that parking lot going to be empty? That parking lot is a dangerous disaster. All right. Especially yeah. with all the kids that are down there. Well, <laughs> let, let me simplify that. If you started now, how, how soon could you have a dog park there? With Harbor Coastal, without. Without. I need a month to get the fence in once the site is approved, and I need another month to install it. If it gets too cold, can you install the fencing? Yes, I've done. I did the dog park in the winter time when I built it last time. So, so it, it it could be up in a matter of months. Winter so, so, time is, our winter time is the best time. Can, you I know. Ask, can I ask a question also that we didn't get to ask about this location? How does flooding affect this location? Because that floods also, right? No, no, up there. No. Uh, when it's bad flooding, it does. No. No, no, no. When Super Storm Sandy comes that's back awesome. around, it may flood, but that's it. I, I would just like to talk to our village attorney. I, I think HCZMC is not optional. This is uh, this is not this is an unlisted action under Seeker. It's not on the Type Two list. So when it's an unlisted action, I mean we have a few other parameters of exemptions in our code. It has to go to Harbor and Coastal Management Commission. It's just part of the environmental review, so right? I don't let, know how let, we let, just let me let me re let, rephrase it. Is every time the village put up a fence, do we have to go to Harbor Coastal on that? But we're not just putting up yes, a fence. So, yeah, provided that I can. Wait, 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 wait. Go ahead, Bob. I have to look at the parameters. I haven't looked at the HCZFC parameters in a while. I have. But I have to take mm -hmm. a look at it and see if it requires a consistency determination. A consistency determination would be made by this board, but. It requires advice from the EDH. If it falls within the parameters for requiring a consistency determination, it requires advice from HCZMC. Now, now my, my problem with the, with, with the uh, request from HCZMC was that it was going to cost us money to, to do. But um, uh, from what I understand, um, um, that you, you can have the, uh, the new engineer do it when he comes on, right? Jerry? Yeah. I can, but Lou, I, I've got. I've got serious projects that are that the engineer has to work on. I can't, you know, first day out of the gate, put him on a dog park and then not worry about the order on consent, the save the sound and all the other stuff that we're dealing with. I, I can't I can't do that. I'm just being upfront and honest with you. I can't I can't do that. So what is it? What is the what the, what that uh, board is asking for? What, what's it going to cost us? We had an estimate from Keller's sessions of twenty thousand dollars to provide that information. <laughs> Because we did ask it early on. Twenty thousand dollars to do what? I'm sorry. I'd have to resurrect it and read it to you, but I can send it to you. It was permitting. It was more than what HCZM has requested. It was a yeah. bigger. It, it was, was everything. It was, it was designs. It was plans. It yeah. was everything. It was more than what HCZM is requesting. <laughs> and what's the total budget for uh, complete completion? Estimated. The last the last quote we received for the fence was forty three thousand uh, dollars, and we were going to install it ourselves. And that's what okay, the cost to that. How long ago was that quote? If I may ask. Uh, May, April, something so like that. Probably it's gone up, right? It may have. Yeah, it may have. 
I'm right, not so sure if budget, you're... but I'm not sure if budget is is the conversation here tonight. Are we afraid it's going to cost a lot of money? No, it, no, this, no that's not it. But let, let's get this is all about site right now. Yeah. So you want to look I'm at not other... in the site. I'm not in the site business. You guys decide that. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thanks, thanks for throwing the hot potato, Jerry. No, 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 no. <laughs> thanks, thanks. I'm just just up front. That's it. Uh, okay. So, so did, well, I let was, me, let me know, finish, please. So we need, just so we know where we're looking, we need a site that has parking, mm -hmm. possibly a, a convenient water source and an area to pour a concrete pad, and it has to be about an acre. Mm -hmm. So let's not get off the beam. That, that Those are the things that we need. Yeah, well, that's, those are the parameters and that we've been so looking at. I don't know if you guys looked at the map that um, was attached. There's an area that is next to TD Bank. It's not green. It's it's not Taylor's Lane. It is. It backs up to Mangrove's Nursery. Greenhaven. That was, yeah, right, right. When you right when you make the right in between TD Bank and Mangrove's. So that was the first place that we went to look. That that's wooded now, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. It's um, practically in right. And it's more. It's more than an acre. Yeah. No, hasn't that been uh, kind of used by somebody? Yeah, Mango is using yes. there's, there's well, they, it. Would, would, it's, it's village property, but I thought yeah. that that was resolved. Uh, Not resolved. No. Not resolved. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so it, it, that would require clearing, clearing trees. Yes and no, though, because mm -hmm. from what I've been hearing from the dog owners this past these past four days, you would want to keep some of some some of it, right? I mean, Carrie can speak to it more if you want to allow her. To you do. No, why, why don't we do this? Yes. Why don't we get ask for three more members for your committee? Because you don't want more than that. No, that's good. That yeah. sounds good. That's, and uh, that gives you a total of nine. Yeah. And we, I mean, we would try to move as quickly as possible. Yes, please do, because we need to have a dog park when people exactly. have been waiting and for we, years. And we understand that. And, and, they, and they, they thought it was going to happen yes. no, I six don't. months ago. But I would rather see it happen uh, the right way. I, I understand that, but you're not the one that's going to get I, the 4,000 emails. Oh, I did. Don't yeah. worry. No, no, you don't. Not believe as me. Issue, believe me. You, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to assure you all, too, that we want to work with you and we want to do what's best for everyone. And we're not trying to cause trouble here or cause trouble there. We're just trying to find the best, quickest, but the best solution. And, and Tina, I, I think it needs to be a place that people can get to easily. I mean, you know, it, it's not, uh, it's not a it's not a, a toxic waste dump, no. they're dogs. But and and I know a, lo a number of children who own dogs. Yes. So, that are incompatible. If you look at the dog parks in the other communities, they're not really centrally located in that community. This they is, are this is well, our community. You know, yes. I, I understand that, but you can't okay. have everything at the harbor either, you know? Okay. Uh, we understand. Uh, we, we'll ask for three more members. We have a long agenda that we have to get through before the meeting. Okay. Well, thank you. Jerry, thank, thank you, Kelly. Can we get listening. Jerry? Can we get this advertised uh, ASAP for three for three openings? I, Sally, I'm I'm guessing people are watching tonight. We have about forty or more than that of people who've emailed us, and maybe we can put it in the newsletter Friday. And yeah, we, you know, we can put it in the newsletter Friday. Absolutely, sure. Okay. Interested in the dog parks? Sign up and respond to all the people who yeah, actually. I, I would also them. put a time limit of one week to respond. Yeah. 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 If you could think fast, work hard, and uh, dedicated, apply now. Pay zero, benefits none. You might get a few complaints. <laughs> Pay zero and worth every penny. And be careful for what you wish for. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Uh -huh. Just that we try to make sure that they are from different areas, different they're all concentrated in one place, that's because a, that's the point, is to try yeah. and get more people think that. That's my only that's comment a, at the moment. Thank you. That, that's a uh, something we agree with. Okay. Uh, all right, we're, we're gonna go to what's on for tonight. 
uh, September 12, 2022, uh, requesting the Westchester County remove set of abutments on the Anita Lane Bridge. Uh, da, 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 and it's on for the regular meeting tonight. Everybody's fine with having that on for the regular meeting? I'm fine with it. I'm, yeah. fond, I, I'm very fond of it. I'm very happy with it, but I would like to add one phrase at the end of the last uh, resolve. Uh, so I know this is going to get. Okay, go ahead. What is it? Okay. Um, For consideration to be put on the next fiscal uh, on the next um, uh, fiscal budget. That's what they're reviewing now. They're setting up their budget for the next fiscal year. So, um, so for consideration for the twenty, is it would they be twenty twenty two? They do. They do January to January. So the twenty three twenty twenty three budget. Twenty three budget. The first was off clause on the top of the second page. Where it says the Westchester County include funding in its capital budget. And just in, state in, in the 2023 20, capital budget. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. There you go. Great. Done. Uh, new business. Uh, purchase of one. I'm just trying that for next time. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> It's enough people here to want to do this. Uh, purchase uh, of one F50 XL Super Crew box. Oh, didn't we talk about this at the last meeting? No. no. There were a number of vehicles that we talked about at the last meeting that were Chevys. Uh, these, this, that mic is on. That or oh, sorry about that. Um, there were, what we talked about uh, last meeting were several uh, Chevys for public works uh, and uh, other departments. Uh, this is uh, in our capital budget that we had for a couple of years, plans purchases for one vehicle for the Marine Education Center to affectionate to repair what uh, after you were talking about the last meeting, we affectionately call it the fishmobile uh, yeah. and um, a, uh, a truck for the recreation department. And, Thank you. And just to be sure, this won't become another fishmobile because the fish will be in the flatbed, not correct. Yeah, it, that's it, that's there will be some separation between between the, fish and people. The vehicle operator and the fish. This, this is a shared vehicle, or this is for the one each. No, one each. They because currently well, share my vehicle. You know, one of the other things is that uh, uh, the F one hundred and fifty is come equipped with generators. So, yeah. especially with the Marine Education Center, uh, in the event that there's a power outage. Uh, we can provide power to keep the tanks running. Same thing with the uh, pavilion, uh, if it were to be ever used for emergencies. emergencies mm -hmm. uh, it, it does present uh, an opportunity to uh, keep those buildings running. I, I understand the need and the desire, uh, but it seems to me that uh, there's going to be a lot of downtime when it's not being used. And that seems to me to raise the question of have, trying to have better coordination of the equipment that we have. So. You know, if you put a plow on it, for instance, uh, uh, you know, in the generator, you'd, and you shared it with the, uh, the harbor master uh, it, uh, and the parks department, and you schedule it better uh, and coordinate better. Uh, you know, we don't have something sitting there uh, that's very expensive. It just seems to me to be better to. Uh, you know, uh, to have more coordination as opposed to just more vehicles. Well, yeah, I, I did include some backup uh, from uh, Kyle Troy from the Marine Education Center about the locations where she's going. And this doesn't even include the number of uh, educational institutions that mm -hmm. she's traveling to. That, uh, but we have a car for her right now. We're replacing, you, this, this would replace it. This is gonna replace that for a more appropriate vehicle uh, for the operation. Right. Mm -hmm. I believe we, you know, we're getting equipment heavy, and we need to be better coordinated because there's downtime on lots of things that uh, we have. Okay, uh, I'm fine for putting this off for tonight. Anybody? Is is there a consensus to put this on for tonight? Yes. Norm? I'm okay with putting it on, but we have delayed our. The, you know, I know we have capital budget, but it's just a list of, okay. of what we're going to spend. We have got to really figure out how we're going to execute the capital budget. And um, because we're going to get to a point where we're not going to be able to fund something, whether or not it's in capital budget, because we've spent too much money. So I think we have to. Okay, thank you. Victor, you're right. 
Yeah. Uh, traffic and parking related matters on for September 27th, regular meeting, establishing a time parking on Old White Plains Road and establishing a no standing restriction on Madison. Uh, this is what we talked about. We, we, we've just lowered the recommendation. Yeah, correct. You know, my interpretation of the recommendation yes. of the village board from the last meeting was to uh, increase the length of the existing restriction on yes. Madison by two spaces, which is another 40 feet, mm -hmm. and to change the parking on the White Plains Road to only allow 15 minute parking for deliveries. People, for deliveries, but also yeah, access to the business. Yeah. That was Dan Natchez's suggestion. Yeah. Good idea. We have right now Madison, uh, sorry, White Plains Road has. Uh, 30 minute parking. I'm the floor, but that's what it is. That's what that, those signs are posted, and that's what has been adopted by the village. Uh, I'll check, but I, I didn't see that restriction in, in the code. That, you know, I, I checked the code before I prepared these resolutions. Good. So it, it may be that, uh, unfortunately, like the existing sign on Madison, that's it's in the field, but it's not in the code. Oh, okay. so uh, it's unfortunately would not be the first time that uh, that, that, has, yeah. that has happened. Scribner's error. Uh, as, uh, or <laughs> so as we're installing these new signs, can we make sure that we conform it and take down signs that aren't accurate? Yeah, I, I, that, that's so important. But if, if that's the case, then I would ask the traffic commission to look at whether or not it, the 30 minute parking for the rest of the street you know, that's that's what the signs are, and that's what it's supposed to be. Not that it's enforced, but that was the whole purpose. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't understand. I, I just read the resolutions as I interpreted the board. So I know you, you interpreted correctly. But I think, but I think, I think what I think what Dan Nash is saying is that the traffic commission may have made a recommendation based on the assumption that the signs were correct, and if they're not correct, either they have to be before they're removed either, I mean, the traffic commission needs to factor that in. Did they think, did at some point did the traffic commission make the recommendation and signs got put up, but they never got voted on? Well, the, the original recommendation from the traffic commission was to eliminate parking around yeah. the perimeter of the park, mm -hmm. which included two old spaces White on the Old White Plains Road and uh, several spaces. 100 and something feet, 120 feet yeah. on uh, Madison. But what I'm saying is that they may have thought that those 30 minute parking signs were in force. I don't remember that ever coming up. Yeah, I, I, I don't so I, I'm just, I think, I think they, we should maybe ask them to review that in addition to doing this. So you just want to talk about tonight, the Madison Street part and leave no, the old white foot? I don't have a problem with the resolution that I'm proposed. What I'm saying is that if what, no, I thought that the 30 minute parking you know, is what the village, you know, the village code. You're saying again that it's not. So okay. if it's not, then I, I'm asking that the traffic commission review that and determine whether or not it should be, you know, what to do with the rest of that. Yeah, we take the signs down. Right. I mean, uh, but it's. Can I approach as the traffic commissioner? So uh, just give us a second to talk about this, that. okay? This is our work session. I'll let you talk in a minute. But, you know, we, I, I, I think. What we talked about, what we say now is that there's no time restriction I, I didn't, in the code. I didn't notice it in the code. I'll, I'll look again. Okay. But I, I didn't notice it. But okay. That's a, that's a, but this this uh, resolution is fine, though, right? We can, we should Hold on. Ahead. If you want to talk, now you go to Mike. But just, for now on, I'm going to be pretty strict. This is this is the board's work session. It's not. I don't go to your work sessions. And just and go ahead, go ahead. But, but it's just, it's just, it's just hard to get stuff done. Where to go ahead, go to the mic. Go to the mic. Go to the mic. I'm more a body, a member of the traffic commission, and I, I'm approaching the the day as, as a member of the traffic commission to clarify. Fair enough. A sticky situation that we're having here, and we're going in a, in a stalling circle in regard to parking. This has come through three different boards with three different recommendations, all to establish a no parking that we agreed upon, one no parking on Old White Plains Road, and two additional no parking on Madison Street. There is already an additional no parking 
from that corner on Madison and Old White Plains. I don't understand where the confusion came in or where the no standing came in or where adding additional time to parking came in because that really wasn't part of the recommendation whatsoever. It, was, it wasn't. That's something that we changed and that's that's our prerogative too. I understand, but you do have recommendations from the board requesting for two parts because it's a dangerous situation as far as the parking and the traffic. We as a traffic commission have talked about several other locations within Washingtonville on that corridor that are giving us the expressly same, same concern and same issue as far as being considered for no parking removal for safety and security as far as driving and pedestrian use. This is an agreed upon two additional spots and one spot on Oway Plains Road to open up that area because that area becomes double and triple parked. There is a parking restriction on Oway Plains Road. Currently, that is not enforced. Residential parking, however, was erroneously left off on Oway Plains Road and that one section of Madison Street. That is where the problem is entailed and lies, right there. So after much ado, we came to the conclusion and agreement to remove two additional spots and one on, Mat on Old Way Plains Road. I, I can't see any other clarity than doing something in, in that nature to support what needs to be done. I mean, you have a dangerous issue and you have pictures, you have backup, you have requests, you have different com committees that are asking for this for, for a reason. And if we ignore that reason, we were going to ignore that reason on the next corner or the following corner that we asked because there are several coming up that are we're going to be in the same position. We're going to be in the same position of having cars double <coughs> and triple parked. That's the problem. Somebody is going to get hurt, and that's not what was agreed upon. So, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. So, yeah. schedule is so three twenty six ninety one of the Village Code is time limit parking on Old White Plains Road. There are two restrictions that have been promulgated. The first is a 60 minute restriction from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday through Saturdays, except holidays, from Grand Street to the Marinick Avenue. The second restriction is a 15 minute restriction on the east side of the roadway from a point 20 feet north of the crosswalk at the intersection of the Marinick to a point 20 feet north thereof. So that's those are the two restrictions on old white the time limit parking restrictions on old Plains Road. On old white Plains Road from a, uh, uh, so, from Marinick Avenue to Madison, a one hour restriction. No, it's from Marinick Avenue to Grand. From Grand Street to Marinick Avenue. On which side? The east side. The east side. So if there's a thirty minute sign out there, that is not in conformance with the village code. Sign. I, I understand there may be a sign there, but if it's not in the if it's not correct to what's in the village code, it, the code is what issue. the code is what governs, it's not the sign. Yeah. So, so get a ticket for that. It's a sixty minutes. So, and and, and I, my question about that is: when the traffic commission made their recommendations, did they think parking was limited to thirty minutes, or did they understand it was limited to sixty? Okay, can I make a suggestion mm -hmm. just so we can move on? Why don't we do tonight, Madison? Why don't we do Madison tonight? Send old white plants back to the uh, traffic commission uh, for reevaluation. Okay. Fair enough. Good. All righty. That makes sense to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Makes sense to me. At least we've got something done. Uh, half a little. Right. Um, traffic. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm just going to see. Okay. We're not. You get, let me just go back to the top. Old business. That's on because we're going to deal with that in the future. Uh, wetlands were waiting for HCM. Dog park, we did. Okay. Uh, the Long Island Sound is going to be on for the 11th. I'm just going to check all this. Amending April 21st resolutions to provide funding for first year installation subscriptions for river gauges. All right, we did that. Uh, requesting we did that. September 12th, lowering speed limits we're going to do on. Bob, you know about this, right? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, I'll give you a pull on that too. Time restrictions. Okay, that brings us, wow, new business C. Uh, traffic and parking related matters on for October 11th. Okay. Dan, you want to walk us through this? Uh, sure. Uh, four of the five, four, sorry, four of the five were discussed at either uh, the most recent traffic safety committee, commission meeting or the one before that. Uh, the no standing restriction on Old White Plains Road, uh, that would be to extend uh, where there is an existing no parking or, or, or existing restriction by the bakery to increase that by essentially one additional space in front of that. Um, uh, the no, the time to Wait, go let, let, oh. let do, do it by the draft attachments. The okay. first one is Palmer Avenue. Yeah, so Palmer Avenue, uh, I sent an email to the board. Uh, this was a, a restriction that was established several years ago uh, to facilitate with some drop off and pickup activity. Right. The, uh, the reason why that was needed is no longer needed. Right. So I'm asking to have that rescinded. Okay. This is a rescind. It's, a, it's to rescind that, uh, right. that restriction. That was a family member who's no longer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Now um, I remember. The no parking anytime restriction on the Maranek Avenue. So on the other side of the bakery, mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, recent repaving and restriping of the Maranek Avenue, the turning lane from the Maranek Avenue to get to uh, uh, Old White Lanes Road, I'm sorry, <laughs> just talk about it, has been constricted somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, I think the commission was actually fine with the, the current layout. But uh, what they were asked for is because it could allow for some queuing in the roadway to extend, extend an existing no parking restriction all the way to the uh, driveway that's adjacent to the building uh, with the bakery. Uh, and this will allow for better queuing and uh, traffic to, uh, to make that turn from Mamaronic Avenue. On Mamaronic Avenue, turning onto a white cleanse road in that little cut. Yeah. So making yeah. the, make gotcha, the turn gotcha. in my okay. direction. Gotcha. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, no parking anytime restriction on Sher Shelbourne Avenue. Uh, this is a request that came in from a resident. Uh, there's a pretty significant uh, bend in Shelbourne mm -hmm. Avenue. Yep. Uh, they've asked for uh, a parking restriction at that bend to allow for better site visibility. The commission reviewed it and agreed with that. Uh, and then no parking restriction on River Street. So you're taking uh, on Shelburne. That's really like just one spot, right? It's just yeah. a, it really one spot, but it'll it'll clear up the, uh, the it'll be at the curb where the curvature of the roadway is to make it easier for. No, I know which way you're talking about. Traffic. I got it. Uh, then there's no parking restriction on River Street. Uh, River is a pretty narrow roadway. Uh, it's at the end of First Street as yep. you uh, the other side of North Ferry Avenue. Oh, uh, this is the way you used to. No, he was of course you second. Yeah. Oh, second. I'm sorry. Second. Okay. I'll skip and a jump. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's a it's a pretty narrow roadway, uh, and uh, there's uh, some driveways on the east side of the roadway that if a car is parked opposite their they driveway, they can't pull out. So this would create a no parking restriction that would facilitate and allow people to get out of their in and out of their driveway a lot easier. Can we do that on Ward Avenue one time too? Uh, we've done it in a number of locations. Yeah. That it's possible. It's, you know, a lot of these parking restrictions, they just melt, blend into one after a while. It is. Uh, so I'm, it, I'm fine with all of these. Anybody have a problem? On for two weeks. On for, yeah, the 11th. Whatever that is, two weeks. Okay. No problems? All right, then that'll be on, on the agenda. You got that, Dan? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right, excellent. All right, the next up, public safety item, access control system for the Village Hall of the Regatta. Uh, Harbor Island Pavilion and Harbor, this is a FOB system? Yep, a FOB system. You wanna explain it? So um, in assessing, especially here at Village Hall uh, with um, um, active shooter in mind, um, we know that um, if they can't get through the doors, uh, we're protected. If we shelter in place, we do have bulletproof glass at the um, at the clerks. 
two Can windows. Can you speak up, please? We have. Sure. You want me to speak up? Yeah. Sure. So in uh, in keeping with our active shooter in mind, which came up uh, recently uh, in discussions, uh, we're looking at uh, village hall access control for key fobs. And then the pavilion and the harbor master office are two locations that we need to keep locked at all times. But staff needs to go in and out very fluently or fluidly. So, um, and the reason we keep we need to keep them locked is because first of all, the pavilion has children there in the afternoon, but also we collect um, money a month, quite a bit of money. So, so we're looking to upgrade um, our lock system so that staff is not impeded, but uh, we still have that ultimate protection to make sure that no one else, no one unauthorized can come in. And and the uh, the system that's now in place uh, is antiquated and outdated. Yeah, there really is no key fob system. It's the uh, push button system here in Village Hall, and there's nothing at the Harbor Master or at the Pavilion. And we've already upgraded the police department, all offices there, and the fire departments as well. So this is just expanding our public safety initiative. Okay. Anybody have any questions or concerns? So when you do this, how does the public get in, gain access? They can come in the front door, but they can't come into our offices. No, I'm talking about the Harbor Master's office and the uh, Park's office. Knocking on the door or mm -hmm. looking at the window. Well, ring a bell. You could put a bell on too, right? Yeah, we can put a bell on. We could put a ring doorbell so we get that picture. We need yeah, to secure the location. Also, you know, trying to make more air, more area, certain areas more secure. Yep. Uh, but you know, like you said, with Village Hall, I mean, the the system we have there is basically how how long have we been there? Twenty five years. The system is twenty five years old. It's not and, quite twenty five yet. It's, it's up there. Uh, you know, access control systems were the standard in the late nineteen nineties. It was like I said, it was antiquated the day it was installed. <laughs> I this told somebody that the other day. Mayor, so, what? This will not be antiquated the day it's installed. Okay, good. that's good to know. That's okay, good. I want to make sure. Glad we're everything. ahead of the curve. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we're trying. I told somebody that about an elevator the other day. I said this was garbage when you bought it. Now it's 30 years old. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Okay. That's going to be on the agenda for two weeks. Great. It's an important item. Uh, senior citizen rent increase exemption. This is uh, something I asked to have put on. Uh, raising the eligibility. Eligibility uh, has been the same forever. Uh, this, this, it's uh, based upon your income. Those with lower income uh, get a, uh, a uh, discount. Uh, this is for the rent, and we're also doing it for looking at it for the uh, property. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the way the property uh, taxes. Well, yeah, the way that it works is uh, for their rent stabilized yeah. apartments. Uh, if you're a senior citizen and you make uh, less than $35,000 a year and your rent <laughs> equates to more than one third of your income, uh, the property is eligible for an exemption. What that way it works is they maintain the rent at a certain level and uh, the village will uh, pay to the property owner what the difference would be on a monthly basis between the current rent and what a proposed rent would be. Uh, we have five people currently participating and it uh, costs about $7,000 a year. And there's also a program now for property taxes in the same. Um, well, there's always been a program for property taxes for property owners. That's the, the, the property limit. tax that they've raised, the state has raised the limit. Yeah, no, that, that's under a different section of the real property tax law that affects the, the STAR, the enhanced STAR, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, but that is not this. That's, right. That's but, but, it, but, it, but I also think we have to pass a law. Uh, we do. And I think, I think we, we have. Bob, do you know that one? 
Not familiar with uh, yeah, but we passed the law, and the law is based upon a certain limit. The limit's been upped. Yeah, I think it's what, maybe seventy-five thousand now. No, no, it, it, we'll have to look at it. Yeah, it's it's in it's in the real property yeah. tax law. Okay. Uh, the 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 other question I had about this, uh, and this we, when we increased the rent, uh, the, the level back in uh, 2016, 2017, uh, a, a companion program to the senior citizen rent increase exemption is it a similar program for disabled individuals? And I don't know if that's something the board wants to consider. Um, you know, I, I, I would have no way of knowing how many people would be eligible for that. Disabled individuals based upon a... Uh... So instead, of, it would be the same uh, requirements as far as the income level and the... Uh, percent of rent that is being paid towards their income level, except it may, instead of being 62, they have to verify that they're disabled to uh, head of household still the same requirements. Yeah, the same household. requirements, except you know, replace 62. Yeah. With disabled. All right, uh, so I don't okay. know if that's something that the board wants to uh, consider or, or look at or ask me to get more information. Get more information, yeah, I think so. I would uh, say, yes, as far as the income level, you know, the, the maximum income level. That's allowed per New York State law is fifty thousand. Uh, we're currently at thirty-five thousand. Um, you know, we are higher than the town of Meredith and the village of Larchmont, but several other municipalities uh, in Westchester are at that fifty thousand dollar level. So I don't know if the uh, yeah the board wants to uh, have a look at law to. I'd sort of like to know what the different municipalities. Uh, so uh, there's there's a, a chart in the back. Again. There's a chart that's included with the back backup material. Yeah, uh, showing did the work municipalities right. are at what levels. I believe the town of Mar at most. Uh, they're either at. Uh, I think there's no one between. Maybe one municipality between us and the others that are at fifty thousand. Um, there are several lower than us, including the town of Marinette, which I believe is twenty nine thousand. The village of Larchmont, which I think is 18,500. Uh, Pleasantville, which is I think it's like 12,000. Uh, but um, yeah, there's a chart in the back. I can, uh, I can refer to it just give me a second. Tima, Maranac, Pleasantville, and Rye are lower, and Larchmont are lower than us. Everyone else is higher. Mm -hmm. We do have it in. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. All, all the backup. In this section is excellent. It's yeah. a bar chart. Um, oh, a bar chart. Um, yeah, so yeah, lower than us is large one rye, but they're in a town of Pleasantville. So uh, if there was a uh, uh, a curve, we'd be in the, we're in the lower threshold of that curve. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's see, I think uh, one, two, three. Uh, so we're at 35, and we have Terry Towns at 37,500. Greenberg, Irvington, Sleepy Hollow are at 40,000. Uh, Croton, Dobbs Ferry, Hastings, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, Ossining Village, White Plains, and Yonkers are at 50,000. All right, let, let, let's leave this on so give us some more time. Okay, and I'll, I'll try and get some more information about the, okay. uh, what they call DRE. The last is proposal to conduct an order evaluation for the village transfer station at 1313 Fayette and Suburban Park. Uh, this is to hire a consultant uh, to evaluate uh, where the order is coming from, how to mitigate the order. Dan, you want to add anything there? Uh, I can add, Mayor. This one's on me. Yep. Oh, go ahead. So um, I just shared with the board a little while ago that um, there may be some um, issues regarding the license at the, for this company. So I think it's the appropriate time for us to bring in a consultant uh, to provide all the information that we're looking for to make sure that um, if they in fact do still have a license, which is questionable right now, uh, but also to make sure that they're abiding by the guidelines in their license and the, and the procedures that they have, as well as um, helping us mitigate the, 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 the smell and the odor um, that comes from that facility. Uh, this would also be a self-examination of our own facility uh, for which we are responsible and we want to do whatever we can um, if there is any odor uh, coming from our from our facility. So um, this has been a, an ongoing issue for many years, but um, just now has um, 
um, the, the, the community um, has uh, um, really stepped up as uh, far as the number of complaints and the degree of the, uh, of the odor. So we need to really look into it. And I think an impartial um, consultant who does this work, this is a national company that has an office in Nyack. So they would be coming from, I think he's in Nyack. Suffering, wherever that is. It's close. It's Rockland, but yeah. Close Rockland, yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so this is a $10,000 contract? Yeah, and I'd like to cap it at 10, um, just to send a message that we're not going to you know, exceed 10. And I think the work can be done at that level. Okay. Um, so but James and I met with the individual. There's no details on hourly cost or how. I, I think the cap is great and I'm very thankful that we're at this point of just looking how to address this. My own, my, my question is, I didn't see it, the backup of how it's broken down or how, how are you gonna follow this? Yeah, so, as far as an hourly? Yeah, it doesn't say hourly or how they charge us very little, there's no detail whatsoever. Right, so if you give me the cap at 10, I'll make sure um, that I communicate to the board. Uh, the hourly at the next meeting or by email. Yeah, because the contract okay. would yep. need to be so. And also, please talk to to our attorney so that we can start lining up both the contract and and how. I'm sure he wants to talk to you. The, 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 Victor, you're correct because the way we left it off with this consultant when uh, we first had that meeting uh, very early a couple of weeks ago, one morning, was that um, he would uh, potentially. Uh, do the background research, but if there is some um, interpretation of what we have, then we would have our village attorney do that. So I agree with that, of course. All right. Okay. So let's get that uh, back up. We'll put it on for two weeks. Yep. Well, Good. We, I'll let you know what the hourly rate is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That concludes uh, our agenda for tonight, 7 30. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, to end work session and have a little sustenance break. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. With the. Uh,
She's kind of a reach of your cell phone. Bye, lovey. See you later. Wow. Did you get him out? Yeah. Oh. oh, shoot. All right. Oh. There we go. Sally, you, you, your mic's on. Thank you. You're welcome. I just want to make sure that uh, a lot of people have been stopped by a hot mic. Okay, everybody ready on the board? It's not for whom the bell tolls. Actually, we've got two minutes. Sorry. St. Thomas is always a little early. That's, you're going to be talking. Okay. <laughs> hey, Jerry. <clears throat> Is that a copy of the network? Can I scan it to the email? You should be able to. Okay. I'll be back All right. <laughs> Trust the young takes a seat, or at least make the copy if you don't like that. No, I don't. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Village of Amaranek, September 27th, 2022, Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. In a motion to open the meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, I'd like to point out there's an emergency exit on my right, an emergency exit on my left. Uh, if you have a cell phone or another electronic device, please silence it. Thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Need a motion? So moved. Second. Organ. Trustees Young? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Sephora? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Ah, nay. Change to a nay. I caught up in the moment. Uh, communication to the board. We want to communicate to the board just before Mr. Tippett gets up. But go ahead, Glenn. Uh, this is a five minute time limit uh, that, that applies to everybody equally. So please limit your comments to five minutes. Good evening, board members. Uh, we had a couple of nice events over the weekend. We had the uh, Monarch Festival, the first that we had in the village. I, uh, Spoke to a couple of the committee members. I went down for a little while. Everybody seemed to have a very nice time. And then we had, I believe it was our last concert in the park, uh, Gangsta Bluegrass. Gangsta, Gangsta Grass. Grass. Gangsta Grass, which, well, it, it was like a, a mixture of hip hop and bluegrass, which awesome. was kind of a unique sound. But, you know, I thought it was a, a really, really nice concert. I think everybody enjoyed it. It was. Uh, we do have a couple of things coming up. We have a scarecrow building contest on October 1st. Uh, I challenge anybody, build a scarecrow, make it look like one of the trustees or the mayor, and maybe I'll put up a $25 bounty who does the best one. We also have the 100th anniversary of the public library. 
in October. So uh, let me start off 15 foot height rule for the flood areas of the village of Mamaronek, the governor's office of storm recovery, hurricane Ida action plan, housing recovery, makes provisions for uh, residents, uh, re re resilient uh, measures to elevate mechanics. As part of elevating the mechanics, maybe we can ask them to help um, with the costs for people to elevate their entire house. If they're in the flood zone, the board should allow uh, members of the, of, uh, of the public who own property within the flood zone, the option to raise their house up to 15 feet. Underneath has to be a half pervious surface. And if they enclose or decide to lower their house, they, they lose their, um, they, they, they lose the 15 foot variance. They have to stay within the footprint or they have to go to the Board of Appeals. It's simple and I've been asking the same question for 14 months. I wish that somebody would put it on the work session, either vote yes or no. Um, I've been talking continually about um, the budget. We have a couple more items that we're spending today, another 100,000 or so on vehicles. And I, and I just want to, um, Clarify, the village isn't gonna go broke. The village isn't gonna uh, have to sell city hall. We're not gonna have to put Tom into uh, uh, debt prison or servitude. But when I say that we have a lot of cash demands, last year at this time we had, as of August 31st, we had $13.5 million cash on demand. This year we have 6.4. What's the difference? We're carrying a bridge and we're carrying a lot of sewer work. The reason I say you have to uh, be uh, conscious of this is that we have a lot of projects. How are we timing them out? When are we getting money back? Or else what might happen is we might have to go to a ban. A ban is short time, short term borrowing, but it's an extra cost to the village. That's why looking at all your finances short term and long term to see exactly where you are is very important when looking at capital projects for the trustees. On the operating budget, we've added a significant amount. Right now, we, we uh, in uh, the last report, we got $4.1 million more in expenses than we do in revenues. We should be making some of that up according to forecasts, but Remember, we're only four months into the year. Every time you add something into the operating budget, it's gonna further stress it. It's just something that you have to be aware of. Again, this isn't anybody's fault. You happen to have more projects going on in this village at one time than we probably have going on in the history of the village. You're welcome. But you have to get together as a board, look at all your expenses, look at how much is spent, how much more has to be spent, what the income is, and when you expect the income to make, best make adjustments to what you have to do. When the water rates come in, my suggestion is you're gonna to have to raise them significantly because we already have significant money that we've put out for projects that aren't done yet. And we haven't even gotten to the capital projects with the county. So I would say at some point, when you start looking at the capital budget, Look at what you've approved, what's in process, look at the numbers, and then what else has to be done this year. Thank you. Thank you. Perfectly timed. Wow. Uh, anyone else? My name is Karen Jastrzemski. I live at 147 Richard Avenue here in Mamaroneck, and I um, represent the, uh, right now, the Washingtonville Neighborhood Association. And I'm just gonna read a formal submission, a petition for establishing a no parking restriction on Madison Street and Old White Plains Road around Pape uh, Memorial Park. Dear Mayor Murphy and Board, Board of Trustees, Residents of Washingtonville have united and formed a neighborhood association, WNA, 
Washingtonville Neighborhood Association. Together, we have created a petition and gathered 91 signatures in support of the resolution, <coughs> establishing a no parking restriction on Madison Street and Old White Plains Road around Pape Memorial Park. In summary, the residents of Washington Bill, as well as other residents of the village of Mamaroneck have witnessed our quality of life and safety continuously compromised and impacted over the past few decades. This specific area is overparked and overburdened with commercial vehicles, gardening trucks, daily oversized tractor trailers, along with a large overparking and congestion issue. This area has a continuous and growing parking dilemma, which needs to be addressed as a whole. A comprehensive parking plan needs to be created to support our Safe Streets Initiative. Our area is the most populated and underserved section of our community, along with the continuous threat of flooding, which causes an increased safety risk with uncontrolled and permitted parking that currently exists. Parking in this area and beyond needs to be revamped and reinvented. With a continuous increase of vehicle traffic along with high volumes of commercial trucks utilizing our dense streets as loading zones, vehicles are forced to maneuver into oncoming traffic and are at risk of accidents. To summarize, Washingtonville's quality of life issue impacts the village of Mamaroneck quality community as a whole. The village of Mamaroneck Board of Trustees needs to immediately improve the quality of life of our village residents and the area in which we live. The health, safety, and welfare of all village residents are a first priority that cannot be overlooked, forgotten, negotiated, or compromised. Below is a list of concerns that has been expressed by the residents of the village of Mamaroneck. One, idling cars and trucks creating carbon monoxide, impeding the quality of life access in public spaces. Two, Vehicles border the village of Mamaroneck Public Park from corner to corner, unable to access the park freely. Three, high risk of uncontrollable vehicles creating a safety hazard boarding a perimeter of a public park. Four, obstructing left and right turns, vehicles double parking for long durations of time without enforcement. Five, DPW is unable to perform routine daily maintenance due to overparked vehicles boarding the perimeter of the park corner to corner. Six, first responders unable to access park in an emergency situation due to overparked vehicles boarding perimeter of park impeding the response time of the police, fire, and EMS. We support an open and fair transparency for the taxpayers and residents of the village of Mamaroneck and welcome an open dialogue and public input from the village of Mamaroneck community to discuss this resolution in depth. Please read the submitted petition out loud for full transparency for the entire board of trustees and enter this petition into the September 27, 2022 board of trustees legal minutes. Respectfully, the WNA, Washingtonville Neighborhood Association. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? Hey, my name is James Abadi, 170 Washington Street, also um, participant in WNA. Um, you know, I was sitting through the work session and listening, and I'm, I just wanted to show, we had sent a, a bunch of pictures in uh, to you also, Mayor, of how bad the, the traffic and the parking is. I have a bunch of them here, how dangerous it is on that corner. Um, I just don't understand, and I'd like to just state that the traffic committee, the police department, and the parks, the 
department all approved uh, the taking of the two cars on one and one on Old White Plains Road and two on Madison. Why why uh, you guys are trying to change it to uh, standing only, I don't understand. If you look at the pictures, that's not going to help. Um, you're still going to have the cars there. I mean, the cars, I don't know if I can show you guys these these, these cars. If you look on your uh, if you look on your phone, Mayor, I sent it to you. Oh, uh, sir. Yeah. Um, they're actually head on. They, you're, you're making the turn. You're trying to go on Old White Plains Road. The cars are head on because the cars are trying to turn on Madison and the cars are just in the way around the park. It's been that way. Um, I don't know why we're changing, especially when three committees, uh, you know, in the police department are saying it, it's a danger. Um, what the heck is the use of having committees if we're not going to listen to them? Um, that was my concern, and I just wanted to state that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Tim O'Connor, Washington Street. Um, I'm going to remove myself as a member of the Parks and Rec Commission committee member, and I'm going to speak on behalf of myself, Tim O'Connor. Uh, just to follow up with Mr. Abate, uh, this has been going on for quite a long time. I sent this board so many emails with attachments of pictures of what's going on with the trucks that this board could take action now versus waiting another two or three weeks. This is a a decades old issue. We need to pull that park into in the line as Genunzio. Genunzio is the staple of what we're looking for for Pape's Park. I don't know why the, dish, the, the situation is with this board that you can't step up and pull the trigger and get this done. It's a quality of life issue as it's explained by the petition. I support the petition. I'm also a member of the WNA. And this board needs to act on it. We don't need to kick this back over to the traffic commission. No standing is not going to work. Let's face it, the police department doesn't enforce anything down in the last few years. Let's face it. So no parking will be the right thing to do on Old White Plains Road. Thank you. Anyone else? Robert Stark, 704 Palmer Court. I'm on the traffic committee. Uh, I want to talk about Madison and uh, Old White Plains Road, two aspects of it. One are the uh, four signs that are piled one on top, of, on top of each other on Old White Plains Road. At the uh, start of Old White Plains Road by Center Street, by, and of course, Dan identified that as. Uh, sign pollution. Maybe somebody can remove some of those signs. But I want to focus on specifically the one sign, the 30 minute parking that we're now told is an advisory sign. This is a rhetorical question. Who can identify the difference between a legitimate sign that somebody has to obey or receive a ticket or an advisory sign? I, I don't think That's that, rhetorical. I don't think he called it an advisory sign. I think he called it a mistaken sign. Am I wrong? Yeah. So should it come down? Yeah. Well, this, either it should come down or the code should reflect what's in the field. Okay, so fine. Just, so if it comes down, problem solved. Well, or we change the code. So what would be what would be the plug? So beyond uh, that one block, I know it, it becomes 60, um, 60 minute restricted parking, right? Um, I think the restriction has listed the code. It says no parking, parking for 60 minutes. The east side good. between Mamaronek and Grant. I think that's what it said. Okay. So right. that, that's what that's what the restriction is in the code. Uh, Are there right. any more advice court advisory signs that people don't have to obey? The, no. There's no such thing as advisory signs. There's yeah. mistaken signs and there's right signs. Okay. There, there are many reasons why you could have a sign that is in the field that's not in the code and vice versa. So I, I don't want to. We had there was a U-turn sign on the Marinac, right? right? Recently. So was that? The, there was a U-turn sign on the Marinac that wasn't in the code. We had to put it in the code. Correct. Yeah. The other aspect on uh, that corner of White Plains Road and Madison that I want to address is it was my understanding that the value of removing some of those parking spaces was to provide delivery spots. Yes. 
so that I, I didn't hear that mentioned. Um, so is that something that's going to be considered or permitted? Are they going to be signed? Okay, let, 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 let me just address this for a second. At the last, we, we are tonight going to remove, you know, as was mentioned before, this is a problem that's been there for decades. Tonight, we're planning on removing the parking on Madison. That was requested. Uh, there was a suggestion at the Board of Trustees meeting two weeks past uh, by Trustee Natchez that we look at uh, allowing uh, commercial vehicles to park there, making deliveries uh, to the businesses in the area. Uh, we looked at that. We've just sent that. We're sending that back to the traffic committee. But tonight, as, you know, this has been going on for decades. Something's happening tonight, and uh, you know, the traffic commission uh, wants to look at that and give us a recommendation on that suggestion. Then you know, we could we could have that other half done either one way or the other in a month. But that's where we are. Okay. Because the idea of having delivery. Uh Trucks park where there's no parking now would alleviate and reduce some of the double parking. That's that was the idea. Just one more, one more. So there's no parking, no stopping, and no stand. No, no stopping is actually the most severe restriction. Yes. No parking means you can you can't park there, but you can idle there to uh, load goods and passengers. No stopping means. You can you can't park there and you can't load goods there, but you can load passengers. No stopping, nothing at all in those things. The proposal for Madison is a no stopping proposal, which would mean no no vehicle there at all, whether it be for dropping off passengers, dropping off or unloading merchandise or parking. It is the most restrictive, which it, it, which is what is yes. the sign reflect the sign that's there now. Yes, which is moving. To call links in. Correct. Miss Laura. Hi, Laura Body. I am recruiting, I cannot say the word recruiting myself as the. Uh, uh, no, you're not recusing yourself. You're identifying yourself. No, as I a, am stepping away from that. I'm going to speak as a member of. No, I understand it. But, but w w just, just to clear the air, uh, when, when you're a member of a board of commission, you identify yourself as a member of the board of commission and then say, I'm speaking as. Well, I, thank you for the pull up. I am identifying myself as a member of the Board of Traffic, but I am going to speak as a Washingtonville resident and as a member of the WNA, which is the Washingtonville Neighborhood Association. I am piggybacking off of the last entry in the work session in regard to the um, older consultant and the transfer center, which is private, which I'm discussing, 313 Waverly Avenue, I believe. But I am going to introduce a concern that we have, and it's in regard to the food scraps. I want to first state that I'm thankful for Jerry Barbero because he is actually moving on this and listening and hearing us, and he is making it happen. Nancy Tum said it best, Jerry is a rock star. And we appreciate him as, as much as we can possibly shout out. But to begin with the food scraps. We have a large rat infestation in Washingtonville and that rat infestation is derived from the transfer station and is moving in all directions as far as the Avalon. The food scraps have been have begun on 3-1-2022, seven months after Ida. I do not understand why we would allow something like that to happen in ground zero, in a place that floods the most, in a, in, a, in a zone that is susceptible to being underwater at any moment. Mimarinic VON picks up food scraps every Wednesday in the AM until it's completed. The cost of the manpower for two men, one time per week, is $600. Times that by 52, that's $31,000. Food scraps are allowed to be dropped off Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 9 to 1. Residents from the VON, Ryan, Harrison, Yonkers, and I believe Scarsdale. I could be wrong if Scarsdale is still in the game. If they are not, I'm not up to date. But they are allowed to dump their food scraps in a hazardous location, which is a flood zone. The VOM Recycle Center, and it's placed in, in buckets for days outside on the ground where it's allowed to rot, and that's what we're smelling, in coupled with the live garbage that's being dumped at the private transfer station. 
I sent a video last evening to the board and showed them on Labor Day, which was September 5th, that suburban carting or what you would call the private transfer center is dumping live garbage on the ground in that transfer center. And that transfer center is on top of our river. Live garbage on top of our river, right next to it, no matter what, which way you slice it, this is running into our water stream. The food scraps are stored in pails on the ground for all to smell as it rots and obstructs our quality of life. The barrels of food scraps are picked up on Thursdays, sometimes on Fridays, from the VOM lot and brought over and dumped into a payloader bucket and taken to Suburban and weighed on their scale. Then dumped into a trailer in the Suburban Private Transfer Center where it sits for a day, sometimes a week, depending on when that pickup is scheduled. The refuse, the refuse gets the opportunity to rot along with the private garbage dump there as well. We're getting a one-two punch. I don't understand how it's profitable at 50 houses a year, $300, maybe 50 times 300 equals 15,000 that we're collecting. And then we're paying out $31,000 for a man to collect that. We're pretty much in the minus $11,000. And then we're not paying to dump at that point. But at the expense of us, at, at the expense of the residents who have to smell this and live with this, we were 35 feet deep in water on Plaza Avenue. That's the gauge in, at the height of Ida. The water was over the Madison Street sign. Anything on the ground in our personal transfer center in, for the VOM and the private was moved, rushed, pulled into the water in our yards, in our homes. I asked for action. Maybe we can't remove the transfer center at this point, but we have two transfer centers within our county that's in Yonkers and in White Plains that can handle this. A problematic area like Washingtonville and the industrial area shouldn't have to bear that burden. I think that's neglectful. And, and we're paying the cost for that by the smell and the hazard. And now it's rats and the rats are everywhere. Yeah. And they're not small, they're large. They're in our parks, they're in our yards, they're in our garbage, and they're all derived from that one area. We have to do something. We will, and uh, you know, tonight we we approved the uh, consultant to help us prove that case. I appreciate the listening. Okay, it, it's. I understand. All right. Thank it? you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, um, Anna Bianco. I am a Washingtonville resident, been there for at least 40 years, and also a member of the Washington Bill Association. And um, I think Laura for speaking up regarding the garbage. I was not, I live in the immediate area. I was not aware of what was going on. Nobody came to the resident or even speak about it. Things just happened, they get pushed in into our community there. And then you have to find out secondhand that they're Garbage is being trans transported now, as well as this recyclable material now, this raw material dumped on the ground. It's, it's unbearable. We have been trying to, I've been involved since the 80s trying to fight this corporation, making things better. It hasn't. I know, Mayor, you were involved. Mr. Leinemer, you were helping us in the 80s. We thought we we're you know, getting somewhere. There were so many meetings and people mm -hmm. left and right. We thought we, we're making a difference. We were trying to, but and it worked out for a while. Pandemic air time was amazing. You know, we didn't hear that much, not, not that much was going on. But lately it is, let me tell you a typical day of mine. I get up, I've been awakened by at 4.30 in the morning by the rumbling sounds of trucks going in and out of the transfer station. As I go down, trying to get a cup of coffee, trying to open my windows and they, I can't, there's no way because I get a whiff of this air, this garbage. As the wind blows, it just, it's overwhelming. So I have to shut myself. I have to, I thank God that I have central air conditioning. I, I don't know what I would do and how I would be able to live in 
my neighborhood or any of my neighbors live in there. You know, nobody's really complaining that much now because they're so tired of fighting this. And if we keep hearing the same thing, well, yes, you know, the village's hands are tied. Um, well, we can go to the county. Well, the county, now you gotta go to DC, DC, you have to go to the state. Nothing ever is being done about it. So tonight I'm here to, I'm going to say just one thing. I'm not gonna, you know, it's a corporation. They have to work. They employ a lot of people. I applaud them for what they're trying to do. I mean, it's garbage, it's a business. So I'm putting, I'm challenging the village of Mimanic, the county of Westchester, and Hochul's office, as well as the DEC, to find a suitable location so that this corporation can go on and about their business at an area where it does not affect the people. It's an embarrassment for people coming off of the 95 towards Mimanic to come off of that 95 exit 18 and they have to pass, but they, first of all, we are, they're being greeted by these overwhelming trucks, filthy trucks, huge day in, day out. I mean, every moment of the day, all you have to do is just stand on the corner there on Fenimore Road, on their way, passing Mimanic Avenue, the schools, the kids, I mean, all day long. It's really, it, it, I don't understand this how we are we allowed to, for this to happen for so many years. I've been there, like I said, over 40 years now. And there's gotta be a way. There's gotta be somebody that finally has enough nerves and enough, to, enough power, to, and I'm sure there is, you know, just gotta get it together, sitting at the table and say, let's do something about for Mama, something for the people of Mamanic and the village itself, because it's affecting us now, it's going to affect the future generations that we have growing up now. Do we really want that? Find a suitable location to move, relocate the company. I have nothing against them, but it's affecting me in such a way that I'm at a loss, you know. I understand. Anyway. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for listening. Well, have a good okay. day. Good I'm sorry about this. Somebody, <clears throat> WNA again, 170 Washington Street. I just wanted to, maybe I can make a suggestion. I worked for Suburban for several years. Uh, the transfer station shouldn't be in a residential neighborhood anyway. It's right on the brook. Uh, they have three transfer stations, Mount Vernon, Yonkers, and White Plains. I worked at all three of them. And uh, there's no reason why they can't be dumping there. They take everything else there. You know, uh, mm -hmm. even, the, even the recycle and food program, maybe they can figure that out. Yonkers is, is huge. Um, they have in Mount Vernon and White Plains. They bring all their other garbage there. Why, why do they have to bring this little bit to Mimarinic in a residential neighborhood, and especially that it's on the brook? I think if we worked on that, I'm sure we could get it done. You know, this was passed a long time ago, this transfer station. Should have never happened. The 70s, I think. Yeah, should have never happened. But, uh, you know, it's been there for all these years. It's time that it changes. You know, it's not fair to anybody. So that's my suggestion anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Hi, Rita O'Connor on uh, Washington Street. Um, I'd just like to add, you know, with everything going on down at that transfer station, I'd like to request some kind of um, testing be done. I have to assume that there is some kind of um, hazardous material in there. Um, just speaking with residents in the Washingtonville area, past and present, um, if you take a survey of the amount of people that have had cancer, uh, specifically thyroid cancer, um, the number is huge and it's, it's very concerning. Um, I've been there all my life, uh, but I know people who are still there, that they've lived there all their lives and people have moved out and they all have the same issue. So I really think you guys should be taking this seriously. Um, you know, aside from the fact that it smells like there's literally dead bodies there when you, when you drive by, it smells really bad. Um, I really think there could be, um, uh, you know, hazardous issue as well. Thank you. Thank you. To Washington Street, I'm going to remove myself again from the Parks and Recreation Commission. I'm going to speak on behalf of myself to Um North is north. I'm going to rip off the band-aid. 
How much more do the Washingtonville people got to endure down there? I'm serious. We got the flooding down there. We got the crap in the air that we're all breathing coming from suburban carton that we're hearing. We have cancer now. We got truck issues. We got parking issues. What? How much more do Washingtonville people got to take? Poor Anna Bianco and her family live around Plaza and Madison. Listen to the noise across the street. You got to take the problems from Washingtonville, folks, and put it on the top and start from the top down. We need help. We got flooding. We got rats. We got suburban carding nonsense. We got traffic issues. We got drug and prostitution stuff going on. At what point did the seams break for the residents of Washingtonville? We pay our taxes. What break do we get? None. I'm begging this board, do something, help us provide a solution for these issues, and let's get on the move here because we're getting tired of being tired. Thank you. Well, Rosalind, currently I'm going to argue. Um, a couple of points that raised is fine, interesting. Um, Dan, you may uh, remember this. I don't know if it was Suburban or Covanta. Uh, I believe, and I uh, asked um, Bob to check it out. There was a uh, court decision and agreement that nothing is to be dumped in that area unless it's construction material. That's number one. Number two, uh, a point was just brought up. Uh, actually, and uh, for HIPAA reasons, obviously, uh, not to name names, but I believe uh, in regards to whether it be cancer or anything else, if you look at the description, whether it be state, federal, or actually local county, any incidents of health of two or more is considered a cluster. I believe that clusters already exist in the village of Marin, whether it be in that specific area, whether it be cancer, or specifically, there are three employees of the village of Amaranek that had serious incidents of health, some very serious to the point where didn't know if they were gonna survive or not. I think it is imperative. And as a matter of fact, it's required. If you look at the requirements, when you have a cluster, it must be reported to the county and to the state department of health. I believe that where you have the sanitation department, DPW, the county and the state should be reviewing the health conditions to see what's going on. The garbage that these guys pick up every day and particularly after the floods is so infected that it's unbelievable. And it's probably going around to everyone who lives in that area that's flooded. It's, it's unconscionable to let these people work and live in that condition. George? Good evening, George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Um, the issue of the day is not why I stopped by, but let me say that if you're planning to pull some resources together to discuss these issues, I'll make sure that County Health Department, County DEF, our personnel are there at the meeting, and you can go over whatever the priorities are and the things that you, you may need the county to do. Some of, the county, some of what we can do uh, is helpful. Some of it will involve the state having to be at the table, but we'll bring the county to the table. So let me know on that. That is separate from my visit. My visit, very briefly, was uh, to encourage you, if you haven't already uh, put it on your list of things to discuss, is uh, a resolution by the board in support of the Environmental Bond Act issue, which is on the ballot this year. It's on the ballot November 8th. Of course, early voting people vote before that. Uh, it's a state bond, and, and the state legislature put it on. It was a bipartisan effort. Both Republicans and Democrats supported putting this on the ballot. But we know that whenever you have a bond act or referendum, people don't remember to turn a ballot over. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, they're, uh, they, they need the additional information about it. Uh, I'm certainly not. I know you have limited time here, and I'm going to stay within the limit. Uh, if you haven't gotten information that would be helpful to you, I'll make sure you get some, although I'm sure you have some access to it as well. The bond issue is broken into component pieces, and if it passes, it's going to allow your village and our county and everybody else to have a pool of money that we can bid on for a variety of projects. Some of them are things that matter very greatly in this community, about flood remediation and quality of infrastructure. So I would encourage you to look at it and determine if your honorable board can pass a resolution. Bedford Town, Austin Town, Austin Village have done so. Other counties, uh, other towns and villages are looking at doing that. And uh, it's basically a statement. 
that uh, that that you encourage the the bond act to pass. Obviously, it's two points of view. People make up their own mind about what they want to do. But I know from our standpoint, if we're going to make uh, progress in some of these environmental issues, we don't have sufficient money at the county, the village, or the town level to do it. And state bond act money being available would be very helpful to your community, and to your government, and to our government as well. So that was my purpose in visiting. And again, because of the issues we've heard here tonight, just by happenstance, uh, if there's a meeting set up to discuss them, I'm happy to bring county resources to the table. Thank you, Thank you George. I, I think, you know, it would it be possible for the Department of Health to check the air quality yes. in that neighborhood? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, I, and Jim, the, you want to sit down to, with, yeah, with, with George, yeah. you want to sit down and have a discussion? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, overall to determine what the yeah, like the, the so rat issues, five different things, rat rats, issues, issues yeah. of rats. That's county health department, so the county is at the table for that. In terms, of, in terms of moving an existing business, that's another thing entirely. That's beyond our scope. We can't mandate it, but there are things that that we could do uh, in terms of health and department inspectors, which are our inspectors, not yours. Yeah, and that's what we would work out in some meeting. We'd have a conversation, to determine what the county can do, what the village can do. And then, and then determine what it is that you got to go. To, you have to go to the state to do. Thank you, and George. Is is there a sample resolution on the bond act? There is. I'll make sure you get a copy of it. It's Thank a you. Sample of what was passed by Bedford. Uh, it's yeah, that, 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 so we don't have old. to. We don't have to it's, reinvent the wheel. Yeah, right. yeah. But you can look at it. And certainly, your your board can discuss it and do as you see fit. But I would encourage it if you can, if you feel comfortable. Doing it. Yeah, I, I do. You go ahead. I mean, uh, I've been telling people, George. Uh, that it's the most important thing on the ballot for us in November. And, and that, that says a lot because there's other things on the ballot, <laughs> you know? So, so, uh, so um, uh, if, if nothing else happens, that has to pass because that's gonna save the taxpayers of this community uh, money. There are things that we have to do anyway that we can get money for if that passes. I think it's important to notice bipartisan that uh, yes. legislators from both sides of the aisle voted to put this on the ballot, but it does require voters to agree. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, whatever the climate is out there, when people are upset about one thing, that affects the way they feel about other things. So, yeah. Thank you. For, uh, thank you for coming by. And thank you for letting me interrupt you. Thank Thanks, George. Have, have a good night, pal. Rita. <laughs> I yeah, just wanted to add, um, if we can start doing some testing, it would be great if we could, you can do air, soil, and water for that area. I'll see what the county can help us with. Yeah, right. thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, to get on to the agenda, unless somebody else has a burning desire, as they say in the program. Uh, no public hearings tonight. <clears throat> what are the bills? Uh, tonight's uh, grand total is one million five hundred sixty-three thousand nine hundred fifty-nine dollars and fifty-seven cents. Are there any questions or concerns? In the board, in the public, nothing. I have one comment. Uh, there's a bill for um, a matter I was been recused for six years now. <laughs> Save this out, and it's just a couple hundred dollars, but uh, it involves that matter. So, just noting that. So I'm just noting. It. Okay, thank you. As we discussed, that's all you need to do. Good men. Uh, I need a motion. So moved. Second. Augustino. Trustees Young. Yes. Matches. Yes. Lucas. Yes. To four. Yes. Mayor Murphy. Aye. Uh, dog park's going to be held. Uh, well, do we want to announce we're looking for more people? We were going to do it on Friday, but if anybody's watching and they have a uh, desire to be involved in uh, helping the village of America find a suitable location for a dog park, uh, please send your resume in to Sally Roberts. That's S Roberts at B O M N Y dot org. Uh, it requires someone who's willing to work fast, uh, work diligently, and work for free. So, if you meet those qualifications, <laughs> please please contact Sally Robbins. Uh, all righty. What a deal. Eh, you know. Resolution scheduling public hearing on PLLD. Okay, that's going to be held, the tree law. Uh, funding for construction. Res no. oh. Resolution authorizing additional funding for construction, inspection, construction services for the Hillside Avenue Bridge of Marinick River replacement. Dan, can you give us a short? Sure. Um, 
the construction length has gone on a little bit longer than anticipated, a lot of it because we were delayed by the state DOT. So our construction inspector has had to have been out there longer than originally anticipated. Uh, this is the request, I believe it's for uh, an additional 117,000. He, he was supposed to be nine months, he, he had to go 12 months. Yeah. So it's really, we're increasing it by a third. Yeah, and this is part of the additional funding request that we've made of Westchester County for additional grant. Right, and we've asked Westchester County, for, George is gone. When we need the money, he's gone. <laughs> we asked Westchester County for an additional million dollars. Uh, 1.3, give or take. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and where does that request stand at this point? Uh, my understanding is that the, they're trying to get it <clears throat> onto the Board of Legislators agenda for their October meeting. Right. So why can't we wait till the end of October to figure this out? Because we have to pay the guy one way or the other. Yeah. We're paying him not contingent on if we get the money. We're paying him as a good faith thing. I'll make the motion. Second. Borgie, please. Trustee is young. Yes. Trustee Natchez. Yes. Trustee Lucas. Yes. Trustee Tafur. Yes. Mayor Murphy. Aye. Uh, new business uh, resolution authorizing traffic safety commission recommendations for no parking restrictions on Old White Plains Road and Madison. And we're going to bifurcate this, and we're going to take first uh, the Madison. Because what we have here on our agenda is not what you would want anyway about Old White Plains Road for those who are watching. So we we'll just go to this. So I'm going to read it out loud. Resolved that the following amendment to Chapter 326 Vehicle and Traffic Law of the Code of the Village of Americ be and is hereby amended as followed. Uh, no stopping. Madison Street, the south side, from Old White Plains Road to a point 60 feet east thereof. Right then? That's mm -hmm. right. Yes. All right. I will make that motion. Second. Call the roll. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. To four? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Like I said before, hopefully we'll be able to work on Old White Plains Road and have that before us within a month. Uh, resolution requesting that the village, no, no, resolution requesting that Westchester County remove center abutment from the Anita Lane Valley Place Bridge. Uh, it's, a, it's a bridge that no one really uh, accesses. It, it just, it holds the county sewer line uh, that crosses the Mamaroneck River there. Uh, the county uh, a few years ago removed uh, one of the wing walls, but there's still a center abutment. We're going to ask the county if they can find a way to move, remove the center abutment to have a little more free flow in the uh, the river at that point. Thank you. You you checked me. I appreciate that. Uh, any questions or concerns? We modified it just to make sure it reflects yes. this uh, calendar this um, fiscal the, year twenty twenty three. Twenty twenty three, as per Trustee Natchez's suggestion. Is there a motion? Dan moved. Dan moved. Second, Mr. Young, call the roll over. Trustee is Young. Yes. Natchez. Yes. Lucas. Yes. Before. Mayor Murphy. Aye. It's a good idea, Trustee Natchez. Thank you. Resolution authorizing street closures for the 2020 spooktacular Halloween parade and the turkey trot. Okay, so this would close the Maranek Avenue uh, for spooktacular on October 23rd from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, from Halstead Avenue all the way down to Boston Post Road. It's a lovely event, the kids like it, and it's a good day for your family. Uh, and you can continue down to Harbor Island Park, but it's, it's, it's really a fun time. So that's one of it. And the second part is uh, for the turkey trot and the closures of West Boston Post Road from Harbor Island Park to Orienta Avenue, Orienta Avenue from West Boston Post Road to Bleecker Avenue, Bleecker Avenue from Orienta Avenue to Rushmore Avenue, Rushmore Avenue from Bleecker Avenue to Orienta Avenue. And that's basically the route. It goes into Orienta, then back down uh, Boston Post Road and ends up in the park. 
It used to be five miles. Now it's 3.1. It's 5K. Uh, I'll make the motion. Second. Augustino? Trustees Young? Yes. Madges? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Before? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. And I'm sure this will all be on the website so people know the exact times. And yeah, it says it right there. Uh, no. I mean, just it'll, it'll be pushed out on the website. Oh, yeah, and it'll be pushed out by uh, Robert. Robert and Janito uh, sends out the village information also. Uh, F-150 for recreation. Uh, Dan, a quick synopsis. Sure. Um, these are items that have been in the capital budget for several years for planned uh, purchase or replacement of vehicles for the recreation department for this fiscal year. Uh, we use the New York State minivan system and we're able to locate a Ford F-150 for the recreation department and essentially the same explanation for the next item as well. Okay. Any questions or concerns? No. I'll make the motion. Second. Second. August, Augustino. Nora second. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. To four? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Uh, resolution authorizing the purchase of one Ford F-150 for the Marine Education Center. Uh, the Marine Education Center Naturalist is now using a, a very small car uh, to transport uh, some very odiferous uh, Yes. 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 And uh, it, 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 this will help her do her job. And uh, she goes outside uh, to a lot of schools and uh, different areas to educate the people about the Long Island Sound. And this will further her uh, good works. I will make the motion. Second. My friend Ogie. Trustees Young. Yes. Natchez. I'm voting no because I believe that the village needs to better allocate uh, and uh, share uh, vehicles. We're getting vehicle heavy uh, and why they're all needed. Um, there's a lot of downtime, and I think we could schedule it better and share, share more between departments. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Yes. Trustee Tafor? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Yes. Uh, resolution authorizing budget amendment for village engineering department. Jerry, you want to take this? Yeah, Mayor, we're just shifting some money around within the department uh, so that we can outfit the uh, engineer's office with the proper equipment. So what this is, is that we're hiring a full-time village engineer uh, beginning October 3rd. And this is some of the equipment and some of the software that he will need to uh, better do his job? Yep. Okay. You need a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, no second. Call the roll, please. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. The four? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Uh, item 4G is to add an item to the agenda. And the item is a, uh, an appointment to the ethics board. So I need a motion to add an item to the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We are hereby appointing uh, Mr. Dan Carson uh, to the ethics board. Mr. Carson was uh, a longtime village resident. Uh, and he uh, was very involved in the Village Ad Health Ethics Committee. He was the chair and did an excellent job. Uh, and he is a lawyer who is very conversant uh, in the ethics code and in New York State ethics in general. So I'll make the motion to add Mr. Carson to the ethics board. Second. With pleasure. Augustino. Trustees Young. I'm going to abstain because I haven't met the man, but uh, everybody seems to think he's great, and I'm sure he'll be terrific. Trustee Natchez. Yeah. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Trustee Tafor? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Okay, second round of communication to the board. Once again, into the breach we go. Uh, a couple of things that were mentioned tonight. What is the village of Mamarnik doing about um, rat control? Do we have anybody hired? Uh, can we go and look for somebody to uh, try to, on a local level, deal with uh, rat control? We, we usually send our code enforcement officer to uh, cite the business, and we don't, we don't have a, a rat patrol. I don't know if you remember that TV show. Yes. Um, well, can I just interject for a minute? You have to come to the mic. I'm not, I'm not taking anything from the audience. 
Um, as for water quality checking, um, it sh should probably be done at the um, Rockland Avenue bridge on one end and at the Mason at the other end. And it should be done three times. It should be done when the river is running dry, when the river is running after a slight rainfall and after a heavy rainfall and see if there's a difference in the water quality uh, from where um, the Rockland Avenue bridge is to after the Mason. And then you can see if that area is actually adding to pollutants. Uh, there's a couple of things that are off the agenda, but I just want to comment on uh, the, um, we have four entities looking for free parking. Um, I believe we're no negotiating um, uh, some kind of deal with them. Uh, the only thing that I would uh, input is uh, for LMC TV and for the, um, and for the Emelin Theater, they should have their free parking right below where their building is. There's a parking lot down there. Uh, their designated parking should be there. The American Legion should be against the wall where the American Legion is. And then the library should be the, uh, the top of the um, uh, Hunter Avenue. That way you don't have you know, 30, 40 cars in the one parking lot. You can, you can uh, spread them out a little bit. Uh, 25 mile an hour speed limit that you're looking to uh, place um, village wide. I have no problem with it except for one road, Boston Post Road. To take uh, Boston Post Road and make a, 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 a double lane um, X uh, highway for um, basically it runs from Maine down to Florida. Uh, it's already 20 miles an hour in front of the high school. There are no um, private residents directly with driveways on the Boston Post Road. It's 30 miles an hour in the town of Amarnik. It's 30 miles an hour in Rye. We don't need to be from the friendly village to the speed trap village. Well, That's we, the only it, road. It, it, we're not doing it to uh, trap cars. We're doing it to protect our residents, especially our children. But, but you're, you're, you're not protecting residents on Boston Post Road. Yeah. That's why I said that's you, the only have exception. Have you ever walked down Boston Post Road? Yeah, yes, I have. Nine, it's, it's nothing but kids. It's nothing but kids. Yeah, but in front of the school, and, and that's no, already no, 20 miles all the way an hour. going up and down. You're wrong it's, about it's, this. It's, it's, it's a double lane New York Highway. City. New York City. Every street's twenty-five miles per hour. New York City is completely a different animal. There's yeah, a million it, it, people on every a, street. It's a much there's, right. There's, and, well, and, that's your. All I'm giving is my opinion. Tom. Okay. I'm just my telling opinion you, it, is it, that it's nothing but commercial practice. We'd be the only ones with Boston Post Road at twenty-five miles an hour, we'd be and the we first don't ones. enforce we'd be the forty first ones. miles an hour. We'd be the first ones, not the yeah. only ones. If, if you don't enforce 30, why you go to 25? Why don't you try enforcing what you have first? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, we uh, keep talking about rebuilding Village Hall. Somebody pointed out to me, there are a lot of office buildings that are available here in the Village of Mamaronek. We might be able to get a building for $6 million, put a $500,000 into it, refurb it. And instead of going from scratch to put a brand new Village Hall in, buy an existing building and turn it into a, a village hall and, and do it for half the money. It says that might be something where you put a small committee together to you look at every available property that's in the village, see what ones that may be suited for a village hall, uh, give uh, the staff a list. The, last, the staff can narrow it down to you and you can make a decision. We think this is the best building. That still leaves uh, the parking lot across the street. If you want to try to do something with affordable housing, mm. to have that whole parking Hunter Avenue parking lot redone, and above it be able to put affordable housing as units over there. So you know, just outside the box. And the uh, the last one is I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Have, have a have, have a good. Um, Turkey Day. <laughs> Maybe we should call it Tibet Tower. Turkey Day. Uh, thank you, Doc, my friend. Um, anyone else? Did you want to say something? Okay. I know it's, it's a long one. <laughs> Okay, 
Okay, we, 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 we're not having dialogue with the audience. Sorry, it's, it's, it happens up there. It happens up there. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right, uh, report from village manager. Mayor, I have two um, file for the records. It's TNT language solution agreement and the agreement with HVEA for the Tompkins Avenue Bridge. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Report from Clerk Treasurer. Yes, Mayor, I'd like to announce the resignation of Matthew Tollison from the Tree Committee. That's all, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, no report from the Village Attorney. Uh, minutes, commissions, boards, and committees. Minutes of the Board of Trustees work session, regular session of September 12th, 2022. Uh, minutes of the BAR meeting of August 18th, 2022. Minutes of the Planning Board meeting of July 27th, 2022. Minutes of the Board of Traffic Commissioners of April 12th, July 12th, and August 8th, 2022. Minutes of the Tree Committee meeting of August 11th, 2022. Uh, before we adjourn, I just want to point out that our, our fellow citizens and our brothers and sisters in Florida are going to be experiencing uh, something that we have all experienced many times, uh, a horrific flooding and the impact of a huge storm that is heading right their way. Uh, we, you know, we, we send them our hopes, prayers, and our, our, our you know, uh, support when they need it. Uh, you know, it's just... Uh, the way things are going, that these storms are happening with greater rapidity and greater ferocity. Uh, so, you know, tomorrow it's uh, Florida. Hopefully we'll dodge that bullet, but, uh, you know, I'm sure there'll be uh, ways to help our friends in Florida. So please be on the lookout uh, for any Red Cross donations to, to help them out because God knows a lot of people helped us out uh, when, when we needed it. So now, you know, now it's time to pay back, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I just want to uh, end with that and uh, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Good night. 30 inches of rain. 30 inches of rain. Where's your, where's your mother in for? Right with that. Uh, is she that good? Nah, she's going over my 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 brother lives there too. So they're all going to drown together. My mother was in Manatee County. Yeah. And I guess because I visited him somehow. Come on, there. Oh. Uh, I saw that. Really? Yeah. Is that, well, she was in a, a new a new home, which is you know, anything built in Florida after like, 19 Andrew. Is pretty, yeah, but you know what? I mean, it's, it's built. It's just, you know, the house we own is um, it's a, it's a small one family house, it's, it's not a flood area, but 30 inches of rain.